For those of you who may not be familiar with the society, SEG is committed to advancing the science of geology through the scientific investigation of mineral deposits and mineral resources and the application thereof to exploration, mineral resource appraisal, mining, and mineral extraction. This includes the providing of world-class publication, workshop, webinar, field trips, and conference, always of developing the next generation of successful economic geologists. We highly encourage anyone interested in our organization, especially student and an early career professional, to visit the society's webpage for more information. A quick reminder now, it's a great time to join or renew and take advantage of all SEG has to offer. Renewals are now available for 2024, so feel free to scan the QR code or visit sepweb.org for more details on membership. On a personal level, I want to say that being part of the SEG community has been an amazing experience. I've met people from all over the world, amazing experts and early careers like me. And I also participated at the SEG conference in London this year with benefits for being an engaged student and present my research. So once again, thank you for joining us for today's event, the SEG Lecturer Symposium. The SEG lecturers are globally recognized individuals that serve as ambassadors for the Society of Economic Geologists and who are excellent speakers selected each year based on their significant contribution to the field of economic geology. The SEG Distinguished Lecturer and Traveling Lecturer programs provide support for the lecturers to present in person to SEG student chapters, universities, and mineral industry events around the world. This symposium will continue that mission in virtual form. And today we are excited to host the SEG 2023 lecturers for a series of great presentations and discussions. I want to drink myself. Hi everyone again, I'm a geological engineer from Ecuador. My name is Valeria Nogales and right now I'm doing a master's in geological sciences at Cornell University, working on the mineral characterization of a deep geothermal borehole in New York State. I have previously worked as a research assistant in a project called Tomorrow Cities as an independent consultant and also as a geoscientist at Halliburton. I am the vice president of both the SEG student chapter and the graduate and professional women's network here at Cornell. And this is the agenda that we're gonna cover today. And uh, we first have the SEG updates and lecturers program overview with the SEG executive director. Jennifer Craig, and then we'll have the presentation followed by Q&A session where you can ask questions for each lecturer with a brief 15 minute break in between. And at 4.30 after the break, we'll have the 2023 summary comments by our president, the uh, Stuart Simons. And toward the end, we'll have also the participation of our el president elect, Steve Percy, and uh, talking about the upcoming goals and initiative of the SEG for 2024. So here you can see all the amazing talk we will have and I hope you engage with us all this time. Now I want to introduce Jennifer, our new SEG Executive Director. Jennifer has an Executive MBA and PhD in Electrochemistry. She's an Irish Canadian dual citizen who has been the central manager and then chief operation officer of ICRAD, the Science Foundation Ireland Research Center in Applied Geoscience for the last eight years. Jennifer has managed large-scale alliances, built multi-site research programs, and commercialized applied research. She was CEO of two Irish startups. And then SEG new executive director, she has been actively attending meetings and events and participated in the different initiatives and programs that the society organizes. I'm honored to invite Jennifer to join us. Thank you, Valeria. Share my screen. Everyone see that okay? Okay, thank you very much, Valeria. Thank you for the, um, the excellent introduction. Um, Valeria, I'm having difficulty sharing my screen here.
Uh, so Jen, uh, Jen, that was shared uh, just a moment ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can we see it now? We can. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, Valeria. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I welcome you all to the 2023 Virtual Travelling Lecturer Symposium. Uh, it's great to see so many registrants and attendees from all over the world. And uh, thanks to those attending at, at, uh, in the various time zones. I appreciate that for some it's, it's pretty late and for others it's very early. Um, so uh, Valeria gave a lovely introduction to SEG, um, our professional society dedicated to advancing the science uh, discovery and responsible development of mineral resources. The society has a number of funding supports available uh, to its members and those uh, range across uh, from student education grants and fellowships, uh, the traveling lecturer program itself as, as uh, significant outreach, uh, funded field trips, workshops, and of course, uh, smaller smaller events, but also our, our flagship annual conference, uh, not, to, not to mention our uh, flagship journal, uh, Economic Geology, and our quarterly member publication, Discovery. It's a wonderful society that also gives great opportunity for net networking with our many, many peers. Um, Post-COVID 2023 has certainly been a, a challenging yet busy year for the society. Um, we've seen an uh, uh, uptick in our membership uh, after a drop through COVID, and we have about over 6,000 members now in the past year, um, ranging uh, from 109 different countries globally. Um, we also have 108 student chapters across 33 countries, uh, which is also uh, a small increase. Um, in 2023, we provided over $450,000 in financial support to students. And we also funded 20, in the region of 25 field trips, courses and virtual offerings to both students and uh, professionals and our other members. We also have an extensive network of volunteers across the globe. And under the current Vice President for Regional Affairs, uh, Mike Venter, um, we have a network of regional Vice Presidents. And these regional Vice Presidents uh, support and drive SEG activities globally. As we're nearing the end of 2023, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of those regional VPs that are finishing up their terms of office. Um, I'd like to thank them for their contributions to SEG and their volunteerism. But I would also like to extend a special thanks to Mike Venture himself as Vice President for Regional Affairs, as his term is now coming to an end. I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome uh, Julie Rowland, um, based out of the University of Auckland, who will be taking up this role uh, moving into 2024. As Valeria um, mentioned, the SEG, the SEG lecturers are globally recognised individuals that serve as ambassadors of our society. They're all excellent speakers and have made significant contributions in the field um, of the in the field of geosciences. They provide lectures to uh, many stakeholders, the minerals industry, academia, student chapters, and also many public events. Uh, between, 2020, between 2015 and 2022, the SEG lecturers have provided a total of 244 talks across the world. In 2023, our lecturers provided 19 talks across five different continents. These lectures are selected annually um, by the Distinguished Lecturer Committee of SEG and the Travelling Lecturer Committee. Nominations are welcome from all SEG members and SEG fellows through July 15th of each year, and I would encourage people to consider um, nominating people. Um, final selections and recommendations are, are for, from all these committees are reviewed and approved each year at our annual conference. Before I hand back to, to Valeria, I would just like to take a moment to thank the 2023 uh, lecturers, our SEG, SEG Distinguished Lecturer, David Halwell, our International Exchange Lecturer, Cathy Erig, our Thayer Lindsay Visiting Lecturer, Sally Goodman, and our Regional Vice President Lecturer, Xiaoyang Jiang. This symposium will certainly continue the mission of this program to reach a broader audience, especially to students and early career professionals. And it's wonderful to see over 200 participants on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for showing the amazing work that SEG is constantly doing. I'm going to go back to share my screen, and now I'm happy to introduce David Howell. 
David Holwell is a professor of sustainable mineral resources in applied geology at the Center for Sustainable Resource Extraction at the University of Leicester, UK. He completed his PhD research at Cardiff University on the platrite deposit in the Bashville, Bashville complex. And after three years working as a consultant exploration geologist on a range of commodities across the globe for, for SRK exploration services, he joined Leicester in 2009. His main research areas focus on magmatic ore deposits, especially nickel copper cobalt platinum group elements, PGE sulfides, including PGE deposits in the Bushville and Skurgard complexes, and a range of nickel copper sulfide system across the globe with a specialization in Southern Africa. He has led and has been involved in numerous projects funded by N. ERC in the UK and by global industry, including BHP and Anglo-American, that apply fundamental geoscience exploration targeting and the understanding of our bodies and the crustal cycling and concentration of critical minerals required for the energy transition. Most recently, he has been researching more unconventional nickel copper cobalt PGE tellurium systems and investigating the links between the magmatic sulfide mineral system and porphyry epithermal deposit at a translithospheric scale. He is also a fellow of the SEG and an associate editor of Economic Geology. Most recently, guest editing the special issue in memory of the late Tony Nautre. It's my pleasure to invite David to join us to talk about the unconventional magmatic sulfide system and looking outside of the box for the next nickel copper PGE discovery. Welcome, David, and I invite you to share your, share your screen, please. Okay, thanks very much, Valeria. Thank you for the introduction and hello, everyone. Thanks for coming and tuning in. Okay. So, um, first of all, it's uh, an absolute uh, pleasure and honour to be this year's SEG Distinguished Lecturer. Um, and as Jennifer mentioned, um, one of the things I've been able to do uh, during the year is to support some of the student chapters, uh, in particular, um, the ones in Zambia uh, and South Africa, uh, and some others as well. So I've thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to go and support uh, the student activities of the SEG uh, during this. So the talk today is going to be on um, magmatic sulfide systems um, and looking a little bit out of box in terms of uh, the sort of classic viewpoint of these deposits and seeing whether actually uh, they are a little bit more uh, complex than we might have originally uh, thought. Um, this work, uh, an amalgamation of, of, of several recent years of research. Uh, lots of people to thank, but uh, special thanks uh, to Daryl Blanks, who's now at BHP, uh, and Marco Fiorentini at UWA, and many others with this. So first of all, just going to say why nickel copper PGE deposits? Well, they are our major source of PGEs. What's, uh, what's so useful about PGEs, apart from jewellery? Uh, well, they're used in catalytic converters. Um, and although catalytic converters may be uh, on their way out because combustion engines may be on their way out, if we go down the route of hydrogen fuel cells, platinum is used as a catalyst uh, there. So uh, the PGE is linked to the um, combustion engine uh, automotive industry and maybe the hydrogen fuel cells. And as we probably all know, um, nickel and cobalt go into these things. Um, so uh, the electric vehicle revolution uh, which is happening uh, across the world at various stages, at least, depending on where you are. Um, these are the sort of makeup of those batteries. We call them lithium-ion batteries, but as you see, only 11% uh, is lithium. The rest of it is mostly cobalt uh, and nickel. And actually, magmatic sulfide deposits contain nickel, significant amounts of nickel, plus some useful cobalt uh, as a byproduct as well. And they're, of course, a significant copper source. And as we uh, aim to decarbonize and electrify as much as we possibly can, these elements are, are absolutely essential. And therefore, this deposit type is pretty important to our decarbonized future. 
Um, so pretty much linked with the automotive industry uh, with PGs and now nickel, copper, uh, cobalt. So before I talk about unconventional deposits, let's go through what conventional deposits are, what I'm going to call uh, conventional. So you don't find these deposits everywhere, um, but they are particularly linked with, uh, they are a nice spatial association with cratonic blocks. Um, so these are with nickel copper PG, nickel copper deposits, um, which are these yellow dots uh, on this diagram here, tend to be located around craton margins. So some big ones there like Norilsk, uh, Jinshuan, Voises Bay over there, uh, and some of the mid-continent rift. Uh, that's Kabanga down there in, in, in Tanzania. And the PGE deposits tend to be intracratonic in layered intrusions. So obviously the classic ones, Bushveld, Great Dyke, um, Stillwater, Scareguard up there, Pennycat Pontino, uh, and a few others, uh, Money Money uh, over there. And so this is what they look like, these sulfides, the, 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 the nickel copper sulfide deposits tend to have sort of massive to semi-massive sulfides, typically at the base of intrusions and around the margins of like conduit types. So chonoliths, which are pipe-like intrusions in these sort of dike sill uh, conduit networks. Whereas our PGE deposits look more like this uh, with very small amounts of very high tenor uh, sulfides. And mineralogically, these are fairly simple. <laughs> We've got pyrotite, pentlandite, which is our iron nickel sulfide. It's also where the co cobalt is found. Um, and chalcopyrite, which is the, the source of the copper. Uh, plus PG uh, in some deposits as well. So going, focusing a little bit on that nice spatial link between the, these deposits and craton margins. Um, this was really nicely put together in a fairly seminal paper on this topic by Graham Beg et al in Economic Geology in 2010. Um, and you can see the red dots here are, are major deposits which are located pretty much around craton margins. And then even when you look uh, intracratonically, uh, for example, in the Ilgarn, um, so you find that these are actually down a paleo uh, craton margin. So uh, this is a nice sort of link here, and there's obviously some underlying uh, reasons for this. Canadian Shield's a great example of that. We've got sort of, as we go through time, 1.9 billion, we've got Raglan uh, up here with this, and then we've got the Thompson Nickel Belt. A little bit of time passes by, Voises Bay in place at 1.3 billion on the edge of the uh, North Atlantic Craton after it's sort of uh, broken away from the superior. Then at 1.1, we've got a load of magmatic activity in the mid-continent rift. So related to plume and extension. Um, and we've also got something there which is close to the craton margin. Um, now, obviously, that's in a way random because it's a, a meteorite impact, but maybe it's a meteorite impact that hit some previously uh, enriched uh, sulfide deposits at the edge of the, the craton there, which uh, is a debate in itself, but uh, uh, we'll leave that for now. So why the craton margins? So this is the model. OK, so this is why we find these deposits around craton margins. So if you look back at the, the Beg paper um, and uh, sort of a, a, a technical version um, in Steve Barnes's um, 2016 paper on the mineral, the nickel copper PG mineral system, um, you see plumes impinging on the base of the lithosphere. And as that lithosphere uh, breaks up, so these are you know, for example, supercontinents breaking apart. Uh, we have rifting, which thins the lithosphere, and these melts, these plume heads, uh, channel themselves towards the areas of thinner lithosphere, have lots of melting, so you get lots of mafic, ultramafic magnetism. I obviously want to point out that these magmatic sulfide, but these are mantle melts. Um, and then they come up through these sort of uh, translithospheric fault systems, again, which are nicely made because we are extending the lithosphere, so normal type faults. And you get these sort of dike sill complexes. And if you saw the uh, talks on the, the, the nickel session that the SEG organized a couple of weeks ago, Mike Lesher did a great uh, sort of overview of these sorts of systems uh, and the controls on that, uh, having to have lots of magma passing through uh, certain parts of this and interaction with crustal uh, sulfur-bearing rocks, things like that. 
And what this model does is it places emphasis on cratal margins, thinned lithosphere in sort of extensional settings, these big fault systems and plumes. And what that means is that our sort of classic and conventional exploration criteria for these sorts of system, our sort of mineral system, um, focuses on those areas with a, with a craton margin association, uh, or search space, if you like, for many nickel rich deposits, and an intracratonic one for most layered intrusion PGE deposits. And there's an emphasis here on plumes and extensional raisins, and particularly high degrees of partial melting of a peridotite mantle source. Okay, uh, so we need to melt a lot of this uh, source material to produce uh, these high degree melts. So let's have a look at this in a sort of mineral system framework uh, from this sort of classic um, uh, sense. Um, and the Venn diagram over here is the, the mineral system framework that, that uh, is sort of put together by people like John Ronsky and Cam McCaig. Uh, we've got architecture, the right sort of architecture. So in this setting here, we've got these translithospheric faults. That's really good. Uh, we've got a thermal energy trigger. Plume is just about the, the best <laughs> heating event that we can have in many cases, certainly in recent times. Um, and so this is good. So plumes feeding extensional faults on the edge of cratons is good. And I'm not going to say that this is not how you form a lot of nickel sulfide deposits. It probably is. So things like Marilsk and maybe Jinshuan and other, uh, the mid-continent rift, almost certainly formed in this way. Now, in any mineral system sort of framework, we've got to think about the, the source, okay? So everything starts off, all these metals in any ore deposit start off in the source. And so the source for this is the mantle, okay? So all of these deposits are formed in mantle melts. Now, the amount of mantle melting obviously determines the composition of that melt and the type of rock types that are formed, but it also determines the metal fertility. So um, this is one of... Uh, uh, a diagram by Tony Noldrup. And across the bottom here, we've got percentage of partial melting. So this is that mantle that's being melted. And the three lines here are the concentrations, relative concentrations of platinum, palladium, copper, and nickel in the melt that is produced, the magma that can then make its way up into the crust. Now, low degrees of partial melting um, are going to give us alkaline rocks. You know, we, we know that you start to melt the more incompatible things, which are lots of volatiles. The sort of end member of that, of course, is carbonatite, alkaline rocks, and the, the metal fertility in terms of these metals, at least, is relatively low. That's because the copper and the PG sit in sulfides in the mantle, and in order to get rid of all of those sulfides, you need about 15% melting of this sort of peridotite source. And that's your like sweet spot for PG fertility. And that's going to give you a tholeotic type melt. So in these sort of large igneous provinces where we've got these tholeotic magmas and, and which are forming sort of layered intrusions, that's our sort of sweet spot for PG fertility. Nice. Now, if we have higher degrees of melting, we're going to go into things which are much more magnesium rich, like Camartiites, for example. And you'll notice actually that the PG and the copper get diluted then because they've been used up. They were in the sulfide, there's not enough left. So now actually they're just going to be diluted. But you'll notice that nickel keeps on going up. And that's because nickel sits in olivine in those mantle rocks. And the idea here is that the more melting of olivine that you have, the more nickel fertile your melt. Okay, now this is good. Okay, but this assumes we are melting a peridotite, okay? And actually we know that not all of the mantle is peridotite, but most of the models for this sort of, uh, the, the sort of underpinning understanding of this mineral system um, is because of that. And so this is something that we've uh, been challenging in a project um, with BHP over the last couple of years, um, this crack and margin exploration targeting CNET project. Um, so looking at that, those source controls, and I'll, I'll show you some of the things that we've been working on here. This, this talk isn't in, about this in its entirety, but it does touch on a couple of the things uh, that we've been working on there. So 
um, the, the cast are on the side there from BHP, uh, Leicester in the UK, UWA, uh, and Macquarie as well uh, in Australia. And so we were asking so one of the questions, are all nickel sulfide deposits related to plumes or large igneous provinces? And the simple answer to that is no, not all of them are. Some of them are, but some of them aren't. And in fact, some of them are very much <laughs> almost the opposite. They're associated with collisional sets or orogenic event, uh, events. So labeled a few there, we've got Agua Blanca uh, in the Variscan belt in, uh, uh, in Spain. We've got Central Asian orogenic belt in China, uh, the Malala belt there in, in some Finland. Now, clearly, if we are in a setting where we are colliding rather than extending with a, a plume or whatever, we have some fundamental differences in that mineral system. And this goes back to this framework. So thermal energy trigger, you know, plumes we've noticed are good, but can you have other heat drivers which melt enough of those mantle rocks in order to produce a decent melt? And that goes down to the idea of fertility. What do we mean for this with fertility in terms of a magmatic sulfide system? Now, I mentioned so far we've only considered dry peridotites. Now, what's happening in the collision belts? So, in collisional belts, what do you think of? You think of, well, mountain building and subduction. So, um, you know, the classic example on the, on, the, on the side there, what happens during subduction, you have mass transfer of things like fluids, maybe metals, sulfur, tellurium, carbon, from the slab into this mantle wedge, which then becomes metasolar. This is fairly well established um, and so what that means though is that bit of mantle is no longer a dry peridotite in fact it's a much more exotic and dare i say interesting rock type because it's a hydrous pyroxenol this is not the only way that you can form hydrous pyroxenites and metasolatized metal but it's it's one and so if we look at that in terms of actually what are we melting the key thing that is actually being melted to produce magma with these metals with the potential to form these deposits. So we've got peridotites. So this is our classic one where we've got all of these, maybe some more for pyroxene, maybe a little bit of garnet, a couple of other things. The nickel deportment um, here is vastly olivine. And olivine and in those mountain rocks contains two to three thousand ppm nickel typically. What about hydrous pyroxenite? So this is where we've had some metasomatism and we've got a lot more hydrous phases. In these examples here, the orange on that is flocopite, uh, but we could have uh, amphiboles, for example, um, K. richterite. And if we look at the nickel deportment of those, actually flocopite contains quite a bit of nickel, almost as much as olivine. And so if you have a hydrous pyroxenite with plenty of flogopite, then quite an, a reasonable amount of that metal deportment is actually in the flogopite rather than the olivine. Now, does that matter? <laughs> What's the significance of that? Well, it's really significant because these phases melt at much lower temperatures. A hydrous pyroxenite will probably start to melt at about 1,000 degrees rather than maybe 1,300. So we're talking about a difference here of about 300 degrees in terms of the ability for these things to be melted. So this is an experiment by Steve Foley and his group. So we've got a starting composition here of one-third K. Richterite, which is an amphibole, uh, one-third clinopyroxene, and one third flogopite. And you can see that the amphibole starts to melt really early at 1000, and by 1050, it's gone. And we've got melt now. And then the flogopite starts to melt to the point where at 1200 degrees, we've produced 40% melt, and the nickel from this flogopite has gone into that melt, and the nickel from that K. Richterite has gone into that melt. A little bit has gone into this um, peritectic olivine, but the experiments show that a lot of this goes into the melt. So basically, at 1200 degrees, we formed quite a large volume of nickel-rich melt, but at a much lower temperature than is needed 
to melt a peridotite. So that's quite interesting. If you want to read more about that, there's not much time uh, that you need uh, before you can do that because uh, we've had this paper. This is the first one out of the CMAP project, uh, which is accepted uh, into mineralium deposit this week. Sorry, SEG. Um, so lead author on that is uh, is Izad from uh, Macquarie. Uh, but that's showing a lot of these um, hydrous uh, assemblages uh, and their melting temperatures and the nickel contents of them. Uh, so uh, have a look out for that. And so clearly then, there are some first order source controls on the fertility of our nickel, copper, cobalt, PG, sulfide system in terms of one, the degree of melting and two, the composition of what is being melted. And that's that sort of fertility part. So what we'll do now is we'll have a little uh, look through some deposits. Here's, here we go into the unconventional style. Um, and we'll look at some examples of melting of those volatile rich sources as opposed to the higher temperatures. Now, what this means is we don't necessarily need a really big thermal energy trigger to melt something if it has a low melting point anyway. So if we've got plenty of hydrous minerals in here, we can maybe have a heating event in other um, settings other than the sort of uh, plume. So first of all, we'll have a look at some uh, fairly unconventional uh, magmatic sulfides in alkaline um, settings. So these are Alkaline mafix, uh, usually in post-subduction or post-collisional settings where you have a little bit of extension. This zone here has been nicely metasomatized um, and therefore it's full of hydrous um, minerals which melt at a low temperature. So a little bit of a stenospheric upwelling, for example, during slab delamination or a bit of rollback or whatever. Um, it's going to melt that. Usually fairly low degree partial melting. So these are quite small, they're alkaline, they're volatile rich. Um, but actually these are really useful because those smaller degree alkaline melts give us a real sort of window into that mantle source because compared to the bigger scale melts, they don't have as much time to um, fractionate, uh, assimilate uh, and pond as they're on their way up. So they give a much more uh, sort of uh, uh, useful insight into that source. And we've been having a look at a few of these from around the world. These are generally fairly small occurrences in terms of the sort of economics of these, um, but they do give us a little insight into, into some of those uh, more uh, hydrous uh, sources. And um, so I've had a look at some stuff from the uh, Alpine uh, belt in the, the Rea zone in, in Italy, a uh, little one in uh, Scotland, um, Strong Garb in Northwest Scotland, um, and this one Mordor, uh, in Northern Territory of Australia. And some of the key features of these um, is that these are hydrous magnets. There's plenty of volatiles in there. So the mineralogy, um, we're not looking at a, a, a dunite or a pyroxenite. Um, we're looking at things with like maybe clinopyroxene, lots of phlogopite, maybe some amphibols, and apatite uh, as well. So um, these are wonderfully named shankinites, which are a mafic. Uh, cyanide. And these are often associated, so here's the Mordor igneous complex, we've got this alkaline mafic, ultramafic part, and this cyanite uh, part um, as well. And so if you're wondering why this is called Mordor and you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, this almost unfeasible box-like, three-sided box-like valley um, <laughs> is incredibly similar uh, to the map uh, in Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings. So you can see there, there's even a little Mount Doom in there. And we've got a small hill in the middle of the ultramafic complex also named uh, Mount Doom. So we, we sample some rocks from uh, Mount Doom. And um, so uh, if you want to read more about this, um, Daryl and I wrote this paper uh, during lockdown. We've been fortunate to go out there in 2019 um, to the sample that. Uh, and the paper, if you, if you want, we've <laughs> as a little reference there to Tolkien 1954, Lord of the Rings, uh, in a mineralium deposit of paper. And I noticed that there's a publisher's note down the bottom, which says, Springer Nature remains neutral with regards to jurisdictional claims and published maps. So I'm not sure whether that's got anything to do with the Mordor map or whether that's just in, in all the papers, but anyway. Okay, 
Uh, so another thing about these unconventional alkaline ones is that there's also a lot of carbonate with them. So this is, you, you would expect you know, a little bit of carbonate in there. Uh, I mean, perhaps even a lot of carbonate in, in a metasomatized uh, mineral source. Um, and it seems like this carbonate is often associated with sulfide. And actually, the more that we look at these uh, systems, um, and even some of the, the higher degree melts, we find calcite with these sulfides quite a lot. So uh, this is from Strongarve in Scotland, this is from Almagia uh, in Italy, and these are from Mordor. So we've got sulfides there with calcite um, associated with those uh, sulfides. And the other thing about these is that there is generally a copper gold tellurium enrichment. So these are not particularly nickel rich, but they do have copper gold and tellurium in. And I think that's due to you know, that source melt melting a little bit of mantle sulfide, but not really any significant nickel bearing uh, phases. So we have this, uh, if you plot up these uh, mantle normalized um, chalcophile plots, you tend to have a flat profile which inflects upwards towards uh, tellurium, and you see chalcopyrite, pyrite in there, and these are tellurides, platinum uh, tellurides. And so we put this uh, together um, in a paper in 2020, um, and some of these low degree parcel melts in this uh, association with carbonate. And uh, we suggested that this that supercritical CO2 or some sort of carbonic fluid may act basically as a natural froth flotation aid of helping buoyantly move some of these sulfides up uh, into the crust from their mantle uh, source. So uh, uh, if you want to read more about that, that that's in the uh, Nature of Comps. And so, if we have a look at some of these other ones, which looked a little bit like this. So I'm going to focus on a couple here. These is the, the Curaçao Valley uh, in Brazil and the O'Keep district uh, in South Africa, because these are areas which have a lot of what look like magmatic sulfides, but they are copper, gold, tellurium rich. Now that fits our alkaline model. So we came to these and thought, well, these may well fit this sort of alkaline model. So they're very copper rich. You can see loads of chalcopyrite here. And um, the purple in this map is chalcopyrite. And uh, there's tellurium in there and gold, little white dots in here are tellurides. Uh, you can see that upward inflection towards tellurium in the um, uh, primitive mantle normalized plots. And there's lots of volatiles in there. All the orange in this map here is phlogopite. So these are lower crustal intrusions formed in peak metamorphic conditions during orogenesis, if you like, almost the exact opposite to our, you know, Beg and Barnes model of, of extending the crust with a plume come. This is, this is peak metamorphic. So, and these are lower crustal as well. So these are hot, okay? So the, these, the, these ones are about 2 billion years old. In fact, these are Bushveld age, and maybe there's something in that. Um, uh, so these are hot um, and, and deep, okay? Uh, and so the interesting thing about this is, although it was a copper district for many years, Eero Copper, who, who uh, operate um, uh, some of the copper mines in, in the valley, they have recently discovered quite a few nickel sulfide occurrences uh, in there as well. So you can go to their website and look at that, that. But interestingly, we've got nickel deposits in some intrusions and copper deposits in some other intrusions. And if we go to South Africa, so this is the uh, part of the Northern uh, Cape, so close to the, but there's the Orange River, so that's the border with uh, Namibia. Um, we have some very, very similar um, deposits in this O'Keefe district. So. Um, again, these are copper rich, they've got tellurium, they've got high gold, there's volatiles in there as well. And these are lower crustal intrusions formed, we think, during peak metamorphic conditions. Um, so uh, this is a map of that area. We've got all of these little black smudges on here are these intrusions, which are these little smallish, uh, uh, steeply dipping intrusions, quite similar to the Curaçao, and then mostly copper sulfide bearing. So here's some of these uh, in outcrop uh, from this paper. 
here. But interestingly as well, in that region, to the south of the Copper District, we have some identical intrusions, which are actually got nickel deposits in as well. So um, this is quite an interesting sort of subset of deposit. Um, and, but they are sort of brought together by having lots of intrusions with either copper or nickel in them. And so one of the sort of possibilities to that, and there's been a few thrown around, including whether they're actually IOCG systems or whatever. But if we um, if we think about what happens to sulfide liquid as it cools, we have a little temperature window where nickel-rich sulfide is solid, but copper-rich sulfide is actually liquid. And we see on various scales in deposits like this one, uh, this is from Manali in Zambia, this is on a centimeter scale, we've got copper moving down little fractures and fractionating basically away from the nickel iron sulfide. So that's when that copper sulfide can move. On a bigger scale, look at Sudbury. So mostly nickel deposits around the main impact. And then we've got the sort of offset dikes, uh, which get more and more copper rich because that sulfide liquid is fractionating as it moves. And that's more on a sort of kilometer scale. So for the O'Keefe and Kurosa district, are we looking at sort of big copper sulfide migration on that sort of scale. Don't know yet, um, but it's an interesting little subset of unconventional uh, deposits. Um, so these are pretty low crustal. So uh, if we think about an orogenic belt, um, so uh, lots of some thrusting, folding, maybe some underplating, if we've got some mafic, ultramafic uh, magnetism here, um, I'm envisaging these things as sort of a, like a root system, which is why we've got so many individual intrusions. Um, and then if we erode that at that sort of level, we've got some of these which are mainly copper rich, some of these which appear to be uh, nickel rich. And um, so uh, an interesting subset, but most certainly related uh, to orogenesis. And there's actually quite a few deposits around the world which are maybe more conventional, which is why I put the, um, uh, the, the question mark against this one, that are present in collisional belts. Uh, they don't fit that model of the extension of plume, um, but they're fairly significant. So we've got quite a few in the Central Asian orogenic belt um, in northern China, um, slightly older, but also in China. This is probably one of the biggest ones, Jarihamu. Um, but then we've also got ones in northeast Scotland, uh, Norway, and Thacker Hill in uh, uh, sort of northern Mozambique Belt in, in southern Tanzania, uh, and a few others uh, elsewhere. And I'm even going to put Nova Bollinger uh, in that category uh, as well. Yes, it's on a crater margin, but I think it's a collisional belt that has amalgamated itself onto that crater margin. So let's have a look at some of these that are in these most certainly collision on the setting. So here's a, a relatively modest one, but it's, I think, actually uh, British Columbia's biggest um, nickel uh, deposit. Um, a great mascot, giant mascot, sorry, um, uh, which is here, so pretty close uh, to the to Vancouver. Um, and interestingly, it's picking up some of those themes that I was talking about, this horn blend bearing ultramafix. You know, it's, it, it, it's hydrous, it's associated with diorite, so there's a little bit of an alkaline flavor there. We've got more nickel to copper in this case, we've got lots of tellurides, uh, and that is most certainly emplaced uh, in an arc setting, probably the sort of root system um, of arcs, and maybe they're related to more alkalic uh, porphyries and epithermals, for which that district uh, is a bit more um, famous. We're going to China here. This really shows us some uh, some of these interesting uh, settings and, and the, the potential to find these sorts of deposits, these nickel deposits, uh, in collisional belts. So we've got three periods in, in the sort of nickel metallogeny uh, of, of, of China. We've got the breakup of Rodinia, which includes Jinshuan. Um, so that's a bit more of a classic model, supercontinent breakup. Uh, lots of melting produces Jinchuan. 
Um, and then late Permian, we've got the Emishan uh, lip, so large in East province, big plume event, and we've got some deposits down there, uh, which includes Jubao Shan. But interestingly, in this Devonian to Triassic, we've a lot of magnetism in this Central Asian orogenic belt, and a little bit uh, uh, older in this uh, East Kunlun origin. Uh, and these ones in red here are deposits from those belts. So uh, none of them are massive, but they are of reasonable size, quite a few of them. And so let's have a look at one example of these. Uh, so this is Huang Shang Dong. Um, so this is 280 million years. Um, so it's got 90 million tons. It's high nickel, low copper, lowish copper, but very low PGs. And actually, a lot of these orogenic belt style deposits are fairly low uh, in PG. It's one of the sort of characteristics. And um, you can see we've got some diorites uh, associated with that. Uh, as well, and it's thought that this is formed in a sort of a post-collisional or, or maybe syn-collisional uh, setting. But essentially, pyrotite, pentadite, chalcopyrite in ultramafic, mafic rocks. Um, the big one um, in that area is, is Jarihamu uh, in the East Kudlun origin. Uh, this is a little bit older. This is from what, 10, uh, over 150 million tons again high nickel to copper, low PGEs. So if you plot up these um, uh, diagrams, you see this sort of uh, very low PGEs with high nickel uh, and copper uh, at each side. Um, source there, widely accepted to be subduction net zones. Um, so these are relatively, say relatively recent, the last half a billion years. Um, and we've got lots of evidence that these are hydrous, subduction metasomatized sources. Uh, so if I put up this, um, this is from uh, uh, Steve Barnes paper, uh, you can see something like Nebo Babel, um, an eagle uh, coming across there, but Nova Bollinger has the same, which is one of the uh, reasons why I uh, raised an eyebrow at Nova Bollinger in terms of that being one of these collisional belt uh, deposits maybe. Uh, this one's fairly clear cut. Um, in terms of timing, this is Antaka Hill um, in southern Tanzania. There it is, close to the border with uh, Mozambique. Uh, Kabanga, which is the large, uh, largest nickel deposit in the region, uh, sat up here uh, on the Kraton margin. Um, Antaka Hill, not on the Kraton margin, actually, in the uh, orogenic belt. Placed during a period of an island dark magnetism. Again, it's a classic magmatic sulfide. Um, but has low PGEs, but it's in this setting, which is not sort of conforming to your classic model. And actually, you, these things are starting to pop up everywhere. Um, so we've got current exploration in, in, in Norway and uh, Scotland in the Caledonides. Um, so these are around sort of 470 uh, million years. So Aberdeen Minerals are currently drilling uh, one of the projects, one of these uh, intrusions. Caledonian style intrusions, probably mint to lower crustal again um, uh, in northeast Scotland near uh, well, Aberdeen. Um, and I'm pulling out cores that look like this. So, you know, classic um, pyrotite, pentadite, chalcopyrite, massive, semi massive, disseminated ores. Uh, again, low PGEs um, and a bit more nickel uh, than copper. So, I'd say that actually a lot of orogenic belt style deposits are fairly conventional. We just need to think about them uh, and open our, our, our thinking a little bit that those sorts of settings can form some decent deposits. We don't necessarily need to look uh, for those plumes. Um, switching to something else, though, which may, may be a bit more unconventional. Um, are nickel rich IOCGs. So uh, if we have a look at the Karajas district, which is one of the world's uh, premier IOCG uh, regions in, in the Amazonian Kraton, uh, Brazil, this is a very deep level of erosion. So again, we're looking at lower crust also. And I think in that lower crust, you know, things are hotter, processes may be uh, uh, operating on larger time scales. Uh, but we've got a couple of deposits there, GT36, uh, and probably the biggest one, 
Jaguar. Um, and I'm not going to necessarily put an N in I-O-N-C-G or something like that. Um, but it's interesting to have a look at this, and I'm not an expert on this, so I've not worked on this, so I'm just presenting some uh, uh, results and images from, from this, this paper uh, by Cesar. Um, nickel copper ratio is pretty high, so lots of nickel, um, pretty low PG. Uh, the mineralogy is maybe a little bit different. We've got a bit more pyrite, millerite, uh, pentlandite, chunk of pyrite. Um, and these are actually associated with shear zones. So there are ultramafic rocks in the area, sort of along these shear zones, but the ores themselves are actually the sort of massive to semi-massive sulfides hosted in shear zones within uh, sort of gneisses, granitic gneisses. So an interesting one there. Whether they're related to the ultramafic rocks, I think is up for grabs. Some people think they're purely hydrothermal. They might be the, the root systems of our of IOCGs, in which case that in itself is quite an interesting setting uh, for nickel deposits. Um, but again, that lower crust uh, things seem to be uh, working in a slightly different way. So to sort of sum this up a little bit, we'll, we'll put it back into that uh, uh, framework from the mineral system perspective. So if we look at things from the, from the fertility perspective um, and the thermal trigger, um, in terms of architecture, of course, you're going to need some sort of structures to act as nice sort of pathways for these magnets to make their way uh, from their mantle source up into the crust. Um, and I guess if you've got orogenic belts or whether you've got supercontinents breaking up, you're going to have those pathways uh, anyway. But the interesting part is the thermal energy trigger and the fertility working together. So... If you've got a peridotite source, then you're going to need something fairly significant in terms of your thermal energy trigger, which is you know, a blue module, and that's fine. But the sort of the message here is that if you have, you know, a particularly hydrous or uh, pyroxenite uh, source, then you could melt that and potentially form some nickel-rich uh, melts uh, from things like phlogopite melting in a range of settings. So there could be collisional settings, a um, little bit of extension, uh, post-collisional extension, delamination, slab drop-off, slab rollback, um, uh, or just the increase in temperature and crustal thickening that you get in orogenic belts as well. So essentially, uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, our mineral system for nickel copper PGs um, is uh, maybe a little bit more diverse um, uh, than some of the classic models. Now, uh, not to take anything away from those classic models, you know, the Camartiites and, and plumes and, and craton margins is still a great hunting ground if you're going for, for nickel sulfide deposits. Um, but there are other areas um, which may be fertile uh, as well. And I think a lot of those deposits that are around the world uh, shown that. And so, uh, to summarise the, uh, the talk, um, those alkaline um, occurrences, they're pretty small uh, by their very nature, but they may have the potential for, for upgrading. Um, so, uh, generally, these are not big deposits, they're mostly occurrences, but actually they're quite useful uh, because they do sort of magnify that sort of volatile controlled melting condition. So they're little windows into what happens when you melt a hydrous uh, and volatile rich source at low degrees. So uh, they're pretty useful in our understanding of this uh, system. Things like Kurosawa and O'Keep uh, and maybe Jaguar, they may even be a sort of subset of deposits in their own right, um, sort of lower crustal orogenic belts. That nickel copper fractionation can that actually happen on a district scale, or are we just looking at some sort of crustal uh, controls there. Um, don't know yet. <laughs> um, and collisional belts as well. So orogenic belts, collisional belts, either amalgamated onto craton margins. Hello, Fraser. 
felt, for example, um, or distal to them. Um, so Central Asian or Agenic Belt um, can be fertile and prospective for these nickel sulfide uh, deposits, particularly maybe in these low to mid uh, crustal sections. Um, and yeah, not taking away anything from the, the plumes, lips, dikes, sills, conduits, chonoliths, they're great. Um, and if you're melting that much mantle source, it doesn't really matter whether it's a product site or a period of time, you're going to get something which is fertile anyway. But they are not necessarily a prerequisite if you have the right initial source composition. That's the key uh, there. The source control of hydrous carbonated metasomatized mantle. If you've got that, then you can melt it at a much lower temperature and you might be able to form uh, these things in, in different uh, settings rather than plume and uh, lip. So I shall leave it at that. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation, David. This was great. And we have a lot of questions in the Q&A section. I appreciate okay. the time that you took to share this. So I'm going to go ahead and choose a couple of them. And please, mm -hmm. hopefully, if you have some extra time, could you answer them if we don't have enough time to, to reply talking? So yeah, sure. uh, the first question is, um, is the spatial scale or the area of the mineral system smaller or larger relative to the regional tectonic activity, which is driving, driving the mineral system? Uh, okay. Which one is this? Is this in the chat or the... Yeah, it's in the QIA, Q &A Q &A. section. Yeah, and the first one. The, oh, yeah, the okay. Is the spatial area. scale or the area of the mineral mm -hmm. system smaller or larger relative to the regional tectonic activity which is driving the mineral system? Ooh, okay. So, yeah, that's... Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, spatial scale of the mineral system smaller or larger relative to the regional tectonic activity. So... Magmatic sulfides themselves have a relatively small footprint in any uh, system because they, these are fairly small um, in terms of, so, you know, a typical sort of chonolith hosted one is maybe a few hundred meters um, in scale. Um, I think the deeper you go, the more likely you are to have lots of those and they're going to self-organize uh, and come up. So. Um, the amount of melting, I think, will give you a larger footprint. So a big scale melting event like a major plume or delamination event is going to give you a broad scale uh, a footprint of, of that mineral system. Um, it's interesting that around Craton margins, you don't just get deposits all the way around. You get them in clusters. Um, and that's probably a fundamental sort of source or to geodynamic control uh, as well. So, yeah. Thank you so much, David. Um, can, do you want to pick an, any specific question that you would like to answer, or I can pick another one and probably that's going to be it for, for time. Okay, I, I can have a couple. So the source of the carbon um, is, is the mantle. So the mantle's got loads of carbon in it uh, anyway, particularly if it's... Uh, uh, metasomatized. Could Cripple Creek be a gold tellurium rich hydrothermal end member of that? Yes. So we published a paper in Nature Communications in 2019, which suggests exactly that and uses Cripple Creek as an example. So, yes. Um, copper nickel fractionation, are we looking at emissible melt coexisting in two phases? No. So we start off with an emissible sulfide in a silicate melt. But what happens when that sulfide fractionates is we get a solid nickel sulfide, but then a copper liquid. So that stays liquid for another 100, 150, maybe 200 degrees of cooling. So that little temperature window or Goldilocks zone, if you like, is where that copper can fractionate out if there's the sort of permeability in, in the rocks. Um, so uh, that... Um, 
And shall I do one more? Because we've got one uh, that um, says... Any... Actually, I oh, we got a little <laughs> bit of more time, so go ahead. Answer oh, okay. Or, or, or so, three. <laughs> yeah, I've got one there. So Thomas Krebs is one. Uh, any particular reason why these deposits are low in PG? So that is a good question, and it seems to be quite consistent. They, these are actually fairly low uh, in PG. Um, now, I suspect that is some sort of source control again. Um, and it might be to do with the degree of melting. It might be because we've got relatively low temperature melting. We're not melting enough of the, 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 the sulfides in the source, or maybe the sulfides aren't there. Um, but it does seem to be a, a very common characteristic that they are low uh, in PG. Um. There is this other question that says, is evidence of scandium enrichment in nickel copper sulfide deposit source from more pyroxene rich melt? Uh, probably. I haven't done much on scandium myself, but uh, yeah, scandium enrichment is most likely coming out of Kleiner pyroxene, I think. Um, Uh, I have no words on polymetallic nodules at the moment, uh, but I, <laughs> I, well, I can, but. Uh... Oh, here's one from Nancy. At what stage of collision orogenesis early or late are these deposits in place? That is a very uh, interesting question and one that is difficult to constrain, actually. Um, so, uh, these at mafic ultramafic intrusions are a little bit difficult to date, particularly the ultramafic ones, because it's not like a granite where you've got loads of zircons everywhere. Um, so in terms of like the these collisions, which often have a little bit of extension and then a bit more collision and a little bit of extension, actually determining with precise geochronology whether you're in place in them during the major part of the uh, compressional regime or during a little bit of extension is a little bit difficult. There has been uh, some nice work I saw at the Platinum Symposium, I can't remember the author unfortunately, but on uh, Huang Shandong in, in Chinese uh, Central Asian Orogenic Belt, which beautifully showed some geochronology which showed that the nickel bearing ultramafics were formed in a very short period of extension in an overall compressive regime or transpression. So um, those are interesting questions that are, I think, a little bit difficult to understand, but will be really useful to understand. One more question, David. You choose it okay. and... Uh... Ah, okay. So in the case, oh, I just lost it there. Um, uh, David Plunkett's one. In the case of metasomatized mantle, would biotite, phlogopite, uh, and amphibole crystallize again from the magma and form part of the mineral assemblage higher up the crust? Uh, good question. And I would say yes, quite likely. Uh, we do tend to see these sort of hydrous minerals um, in, these, in these assemblages. The complication is once you get up into the crust, you can then, the, the effects of contamination can take over. And if you're contaminating with some hydrous stuff anyway, you might be forming uh, uh, these hydrous minerals. So um, yes, we do see quite a bit of accessory phlogopite and often amphibole in terms of like even hornblende gabbros uh, in some of these systems um, as well. So yeah, they are sort of little indicators of that uh, specific source, so yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, David, for your time, for your presentation. It was great. Uh, we really appreciate Thanks. you being here. And if you have some extra time, please, there are a lot of questions that are in the Q&A section that remain. Okay. Um, and well, thank you for being here. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I'll try and get through some more of those. <laughs> okay. If you have time, thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Uh, now we're going to move ahead and go to our next speaker. Um, is um, I'm really pleased to introduce Kadi Eric um, Bayo, and I would like to mention that she is our SEG International Exchange lecturer. 
Caddy Eric completed her PhD degree in geology at the University of California, Berkeley in 1991. Then she left San Francisco in 1992 to commence working on uh, the genesis of the Olympic Dam deposit in Australia and to provide mineralogical support for the Olympic Dam processing plan. In 2006, she moved to Adelaide to lead the development of the Olympic Dam geometallurgy program. However, she had remained focused on using mineralogy to solve processing issues, unraveling the complex geology history of the Olympic Dam deposit and using deposit scale geologic mineralogical insight as input into discovering new iron oxide copper gold deposits. She has co-supervised 14 PhD students and nine postgraduate researchers working on Olympic Dam based project. She has shared the geologic geometallurgic knowledge gained from Olympic Dam and surrounded prospect by authoring and co-authoring more than 125 published paper and delivering more than 65 presentations. She also received the 2017 Professional Excellence Award from the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy and a degree of Doctoral of Science Honoris Causa from Flinders University in recognition of her contribution to the geologic and geometallurgic understanding of the Olympic Dam deposit. Other awards include the Geological Society of Australia Bruce Watt Medal in 2018 and the, S the Society of Economic Geology Silver Medal in 2020, the Australian Geoscience Council Roy Woodall Medal in 2020, and the Australian Academy of Science Haddon Forrest Third King Medal in 2022. She's a chartered professional of the OSIM. I'm very honored to introduce Catherine, Kathy and her talk on geometallurgy, discovery to closer. So I invite you to join us, Kathy. It's a real honor to be here with you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. You have to excuse my video feed. I'm I'm on a on Lombok in Indonesia, so I can't say that I'm not having a not having a nice time, but just bear with me off of trying to share my screen. Ah. Does this come up okay now? Yes, we see your okay. screen, Kari. Perfect. Thank it you. Is. Thank you for bearing with me there. Um, this was a, first of all, I'd like to thank the SCG for being the international lecturer. It's been a great experience. Today, I'm going to talk not a lot about geology. Dave's talk before was just excellent. I want you to, to learn a little bit more about Geomet and to think maybe in the background when we're out exploring the deposits to remember that the purpose for exploring them is to find something, but more importantly is to eventually mine them and, and produce metal from them. So there's other things that we need to think about in addition to just the economic or the payable met, uh, minerals in there. We also need to think about all the other minerals that are in the deposit. So this is sort of a background. Um, just to get you in the right mindset is 50% of the new mining projects fail. And that, by this definition we're gonna talk about, means they don't achieve their design metal production within a few years. Now, so where are things going wrong? And there's been a lot of people that have done a lot of studies on them and, and particularly during the mid 2000s, even late 2000s. So I'm just gonna present one person just a little bit and then we'll move on from there. So by looking at all the data, why these big projects actually failed during their startup and ramp up, or they have delayed startup and ramp up, it can be broken into three different areas. Around everything around the mine design and scheduling, and you can look at the details off of that here in a minute. Um, geology and resource and reserve estimation, and we'll talk about that, inadequate attention to local variability, and statistics and modeling often override common sense. On the metallurgical startup work and the sampling and the, the scale up work that goes along, and this is where Geomet comes in too, is the metallurgical domains when the ore body are not understood. The geological ones are, but metallurgical domain doesn't necessarily equal geological domain. Testing on big composite samples, those samples are non-representative. There's a failure to identify process contaminants, and there's an inability to handle ore types 
as per the mining schedule. And so the, the plant design happens on a certain schedule, that schedule changes. And when the plant turns on, it just doesn't function. And believe it or not, the test water quality matters a lot. And often we are not using similar water quality to what's happening in plant and the better test quality actually gives you better results. So th this is a little bit potentially a problem. When these things happen, what, what's it really about? It's really about lost dollars. It's about lost revenue and costing a lot more capital usually to bring these projects online. And it's, and it's a significant problem. So I'm not gonna talk about the whole mining side of it, more just on the geology and the metallurgical testing, but how it applies to geomet. And you're thinking, okay, that I'm just talking about problems that are occurring uh, potentially when a plant was first starting up. Does it occur in operating plants continually throughout their lives? You bet it does. We'll just say yes, yes, yes. This is an example and think inside of a plant, this is the bottom end of a tailings leach tank. So a lot of a lot of water and solids in there. And that stuff at the bottom is what we call a gel. And it has the consistency of a very, very thin milkshake. So that that thing that says 55 to 60 percent solids, the rest is water. And that that kind of percent water in there, that thing should be just flowing across the surface, but it's not. So when we imagine massive tanks, they start getting filled with this. You can't pump them out of those tanks and move them on to the next one. It brings your operations to a screeching halt. So the biggest question we always face is it or or process related or is it a combination of both? And and this we won't touch on the details from Olympic Dam, but this actually impacted on on, on Olympic Dam for ten years, and it, it cost us a lot of money in order to fix it. But we're now moved past it. But it's that constant reminder of that happening is why. Geomet at Olympic Dam is actually very well funded. So today's presentation is talking about setting the scene. Minerals, if you've heard my presentations before, I'm always going to talk about minerals, minerals, minerals. A little bit of touch on the mining life cycle. Um, metallurgy 101 for a geologist. Some geomet essentials and summary and conclusion. So when we're thinking about geomet, one of the biggest things we have to realize is geologists when we're doing exploring and a lot of our basis of our work, not the work that we're doing inside the labs. It's a lot based on recognizing qualitative, qualitative things. Now that qualitative our qualitative observations, which are absolutely superb, in order to those to convert those and use the power inside a geomet, we need to actually transform those into um, digital form. But that means we have to transform them really into quantitative data. So first of all, we think about geomet. There's a lot of definitions that are out there. And geomet, the one that I like, it's nice and short, is it's geometallurgy is the study of the drivers of the metallurgical response in the body that lie in the geology and mineralogy of that deposit. Steve Williams is a metallurgist. Another really good one to think is we're trying to think how we can go from qualitative information and to make it into more quantitative data is rock type controls throughput and that's so going through the mills but then the mineralogy controls metallurgy and as geologists in a in a in the mining industry we know the most about minerals and we just have to think more about quantifying how we view those minerals bill johnson and peter monroe are metallurgists so when we come back and let's try and say get us off of just thinking elements with just a few minerals, we go back to basics and we're not going to talk about thermodynamics after this, but put us in the phrase that says the, our, the mineral systems that we're dealing with, that we have phases in them. And, and those phases are the homogeneous bodies of matter, generally having distinct boundaries with adjacent phases and physically separable from them. Oh, this sounds like the metallurgy. Minerals. The components are all the assays, you know, the most fundamental part of our systems. Minerals are composed of, of elements, and so the assays. And, and this is an important framework to start getting our, our, our thinking into, is that mineral assemblages, which we all know, are the basis of rock alteration and mineral deposit classification systems. So we really need to think more, and this is, this is that the expiration size, but even when we're doing the early drill outs of deposits and even as, as operational geologists. 
we have a lot of elemental information, but we really need to think about minerals because minerals are the things that impact on the processing. The elements are proxies, but they're not what's hurting the processing plants. Elements occur in deposits as minerals. Minerals are mined and extractive metallurgy extracts elements uh, from those. All right, so back on here, the, 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 we don't have to rely on assays anymore or qualitative mineralogy because we actually can quantitate the mineralogy and other characteristics in the deposit at the deposit scale. So there's only gonna be two equations in here that are really fundamental. And as geologists, hopefully we all learn this in Ignis Petrology, um, that, that, that mineralogy can actually be expressed as a function of the elemental composition of the, of the sample, which sort of makes sense. That statement, that equation might seem difficult. It works very well in some deposits. Other deposits are complicated depending on what the minerals, what the minerals are doing. But another thing that's important is recognizing that the metallurgical performance is also a function of the mineralogy, the rock texture and process conditions. So for Geomet, we keep the process conditions uh, consi are constant. So we reduce that equation down a little bit more. And it really gets down to the metallurgical performance is a function of mineralogy, which goes along with the observations from that statement that I provided earlier on. And if we can implement these two equations at the deposit scale, it really becomes transformational because when we're able to predict the mineralogy across the deposit and then ultimately the metallurgical performance once we've done some testing, we could actually um, predict for the long term, short term or medium term, whatever time frame we're working in, what the recoveries are going to be, what the real cost to process that are, that are, and and what our productions are going to be out of the deposit with a lot lot more accuracy than historically we've been able to do. So we're going to just do a couple. You know, geologists are going to say, yeah, 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 we know all this. Mineral deposits are zoned with respect to the mineral abundances, the alteration mineralogy, the physical properties, and the physical chemical conditions that resulted in the deposit formation. So that actually means that the ore characteristics, ore and waste characteristics, actually vary as the deposit is progressively mined and, and processed. There's no exception to that. It changes with time. Mineral deposits, again, we think as economic geologists, we're, we are, we're superb at recognizing minerals and textures. We synthesize those observations into 3D models. We define altera alteration and mineralization patterns, and we need that to discover new deposits or also find more high quality ore within the existing deposits that we have. But we need to expand our sphere of influence a little bit or our understanding. We need to know how mineralogy impacts on the whole mining life cycle. And we need to transfer, transform mineralogy-based qualitative alteration and mineralization models into models that quantify mining and metallurgical performance. This is moving towards a real ideal world. So in the mining life cycle, all the way from expiration, but it's really from the discovery hole up through your various feasibility stages um, into production, the mining and mining extraction and tailings disposable and ultimately to closure. Mineralogy and quantitative mineralogy matters at every single step along that way. And the, the, the better we get at quantifying the mineralogy on the deposits, the scale, the more influence we'll have or better we'll be able to have a mining life cycle where we, we can predict it a lot better and then react to it once we predict it properly. So metallurgy, kind of metallurgy 101 for, for geologists. It's when we, in an operating environment, we all have different perspectives or we think about our different perspective, uh, sorry, uh, disciplines, um, geologists, mining engineering, and really we'll just focus on and mining engineering and then metallurgy. As geologists and mining engineers, uh, we, do, we visualize things in 3D quite well. That's probably one of the reasons why we're geologists and mining engineers. But it, it's all about space for us. But in space, we can go through and transform that into block models. The metallurgist, however, doesn't, doesn't usually visualize the ore body as a 3D entity. Their view of the ore body is this 
single dimensional unit on a conveyor line that's going into them. And that changes a spatial perspective more into a times perspective. And the way that we change that spatial perspective into a time perspective is called a mine plan. And that transforms 3D representation of the deposit into a 1D version that's actually used for process design, metal extraction, and prediction, predicting of ultimately business profitability. Another thing we need to think about this the last slide on, on Metallurgy 101 is the most simplistic way to think about all the various steps that occur in a metallurgical plant. Each step along the way is, is all about liberating, separating your value, more valuable minerals more effectively each step along the way and separating them from the gang and then ultimately disposing. So the different separation or the different units that are within metallurgy typical are a big concentrate or sorry, big, um, the concentrator area where we have grinding and crushing. You can have simple things like physical separation based on gravity, magnetics, electrostatic. There can be different ore sorting that's going on. Froth flotation is a very common thing, particularly for um, sulfide deposits. Hydrometallurgy circuits, we're just doing some sort of leaching. And that could also include bug leaching, pyrometallurgy, and electrometallurgy. Every single one of those stages are actually separating and purifying each step along the way. Separate, purify, separate, purify. So in the, the simplest form, um, liberate, separate, dispose means we're trying to expose the ore minerals to whatever process better, expose them to our separation process. That separation process is trying to efficiently separate um, the ore minerals from the gang minerals and then eventually dispose. And, and that dispose of early on even means separating the solids from the liquors because everything done in the process plant typically is done um, in slurries. And, and that's really important to remember. So we stop thinking about the gym, sorry, the metallurgy side for a minute and might ask, particularly with the, all the exploration geologists in the audience, is um, when should Geomet really start? And I would argue that it starts, you know, post the discovery hole. And this is an example of a nice piece of drill core from Oak Dam and this very high grade boronite here. And I, we all wish that we had deposits made of that. So Geomet, a real essentials list that I come up with a short list and there would be tiers of things underneath that, but we're gonna to touch on each of these major fields is homework. Early on, there's a lot of stuff in the literature and we need to better familiarize with ourselves what's in the literature. We need early engagement with all of our different technical stakeholders, particularly those that require deposit data. Data collection is all important, particularly what we're doing at the drill core stage before we hack it up and start doing assaying or even tech, um, um, geomet testing on them. As our data sets grow, the data storage of all the technical data that's gathered by the different disciplines, because you know what, all that technical data on the deposit all relates to the deposit and as geologists, we can learn from that data. We really need to understand the quantitative mineralogy and even the deportment of the elements across those minerals. You can't assume the stoichiometric concentration of an element that's in a mineral. Geomet testing is all around variability testing. We need to understand the ranges in, in, in the responses in that, in that process. When plants go, go bad, the average ore doesn't hurt that plant. It's the, the ranges and the variability that usually upset the production. We really need to get all of our data into the resource model because the resource model is the fundamental input into the mine plan and the mine plan process plan is what the business used to make decisions. And then, then we have to, all the geological data that we collect doesn't need necessarily go into the mine plan, a, a pared down version of that, but we need to think of what data that's pertinent to pass through that process is. So we'll just step through each of these different ones. And a lot of people I like to remind in modern sense that geochemically anomalous does not necessarily equate to economically viable extraction. We really have to remember that. So the free learnings, a, a nice quote from Peter Monroe um, doing, referring to metallurgical properties. He had one that said, all ore bodies of a deposit class, porphyries, um, IOCGs, et cetera, are alike in the same way, but every 
individual deposit is unlike in its own way. And we'll think how oh, that that's kind of that's that's interesting because that actually really helps us. So that's how metallurgists view deposits a little bit more is what's the typical characteristics off of porphyry over an IOCG. And Peter Monroe got that that quote from because I remember hearing it before, but then he also mentioned it from Tolstoy, you know, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, which is that's kind of interesting. So doing our homework, even very, very early on when we're making decisions about assaying or how much mineralogy or what mineralogy we should be doing. The first point is really for, for the exploration geologists or the early geologists is that elements and minerals, you know about them because they're used for vectoring to deposits or within deposit or more mineralization within a deposit. The commodity of interest that we're working on, you have to ask yourself, do viable processing options exist? If those viable processing options don't exist right now, you're not gonna bring that deposit on in five years or even likely 10 years. It takes a long time to develop uh, first technically possible extraction routes and then to turn those into an industrial scale. There's a lot of learning from the mining and processing of, of deposits of the same deposit class minerals and elements you have to also ask what minerals and elements cause are known to cause processing challenge what are the penalty elements and minerals in the marketable products from those what are the potential co-products and byproducts and then eventually what are the de deleterious and penalty concentration ranges or limits for those which impact on the plant and you think, well, say early on, why do I need to know that? Because a lot of these things, a lot of those upper ones are really all about understanding what element suites you need to be assaying for fairly early on in your process. And even though we, we, we dearly you know, love our, our full scientific journals, which are fantastic, um, which are so fantastic ways of disseminating information, we often don't touch on the industry related journals enough and that those are the ones like from the SME, TMS, CMI, OZWM, and the list just goes on. They're often packed full of useful information, particularly off the metallurgical side of things, but even off the, the, the more of the mine geology based things, because they're, they're not written to the same standard that goes into a scientific journal, but they still contain a lot of useful information and they're often shorter papers. And that tells us, gives us clues of what's going on in different deposits and how how the how they or properties particularly how the mineralogy is being impacting that process so the next step in the geomet essentials is is all about early engagement and this is about the people all understanding what everybody needs from your from your usually your precious drill core and particularly if you have a deposit that's undercover and more and more of them are undercover these days a lot of times we all required the same or where the information that the environmental people need or geotech and and even the mine side and ultimately metallurgy that's that's a lot of the same tests that are done by geomet and that the thing why it's really important is because early on the drill core is limited and we have to be able to to maximize our use off of that limited drill core because if we have to drill new holes that just delays the process so all of the all all of these different professions require data from the deposit for various study phases simple things like equipment design wear lining and trucks that's a big one um, design and selection various government approvals and eventually production and eventual closures again we all we there's specific tests that we need but we just don't want to duplicate our effort and we try to uh, multi-purpose everything as much as possible because that makes life a lot easy. But a lot of times the test work that a discipline, another discipline will use besides geoscience, they call that test something different. So we need to familiarize ourselves with what those mean. But it really means just trying to get all that work done quicker. Geomet Essentials, uh, the next step in this page is data collection. And that goes all the way from geological logging, any kind of core scanning that you're doing. Um, to assaying to any kind of physical properties that you're going to do. And we'll start with the periodic table. This day and age, we can assay for the for most of the periodic table 
very, very easy and relatively inexpensive to compare to what it was 10 years and 20 years ago. We are all constrained by cost, so those always have to bear in mind. And whether we're doing a hard assay or using handheld instruments, those are still good, but we also have to remember about having quality control on our handheld instruments that we're using. Again, elements are proxies for mineralogy, but there is no way that an assay is a replacement for mineralogy. Assaying can be done for a fraction of the cost, typically of what it, of our uh, sorry, a fraction of the cost of what it costs us to drill those holes. Often, us geologists are our own worst enemies because we spend a lot of money up to the point of getting the drill core, and then we wish to reduce our element suite to such a low limit because we're trying to save money for the overall project. That's, that's a bit silly. We drill in order to actually look at the rock and then to collect quantitative data from that rock. We need to assay not only focused on the, the revenue metal, the, the revenue part like the ore, but we also need to think about, we need to assay for the low grade and waste. These are all important information that we need relatively early on and we just can build and continue to build that up. You will never regret the money spent on assaying, particularly if you have a discovery hole and that discovery eventually goes into operation. And remember that cheapest is not necessarily the best, nor in that cheapest offer, may the methods be appropriate for your, for your rock because not, not all ore types or not all rock types respond to an assay digestion method that we actually think they do. So the, another thing, because as geologists, we have massive data and we're just getting more and more data. And, and our, our other technical colleagues don't really fully understand about databases, frankly. They're, they're mostly operating in Excel spreadsheet lands, but geoscientists are very good at, at, at understanding the importance of databases because we have a lot of data. Each of these little silos, typically, um, we keep all of our information in, 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 in different areas. And this is more when you're having to deal with other technical professions. And this is even becoming a bigger problem, particularly as AI machine learning is coming in, um, that we actually have to be a lot better at integrating our data sets and then keeping them all, making sure we use one. So we can really use centralized data sets, or sorry, centralized storage areas, but that's, that really needs to be in databases. We need to ensure the integrity of the data and why databases are important versus just playing with Excel spreadsheets all the time. Databases are one source of the truth and they should be accessible by all the users. Metadata is all important, you know, so the geology side gets it, you know, it's the X, Y, Z of your, of your, of your samples, what methods were used to get to that point, all of that. And, and the reason that's important, and particularly when we start doing testing, when we don't keep all the test conditions and details of con test conditions, work that might have been done five years ago or 10 years ago on the deposit is excellent, but you have to end up, if you don't know what was done to that data, particularly when you're doing metallurgical testing, you end up throwing away that data because you can't risk it. And you have to re and redo it. You have to redo it. You need to really establish sampling and, and subsampling naming conventions. You think as a geologist, why do we need to worry about this? You really do, particularly as you're collecting more and more data because it needs to make sense on what it all means. And the ultimate goal of this is to spend time, more time analyzing our data instead of just compiling it from multiple sources. So we really just don't like this whole idea of, of, of silos for data, databases and more centralized ways of dealing with that. You met essentials and on to the mineralogy, and we really don't fully understand most of us what the minerals, what the metallurgists actually do with that. And this is a, I just put this picture up here. We won't explain, I won't explain it in details a lot. We often think, you know, we send the ore to the process plant and the metallurgists don't recover all of the metal. Well, you know, you can't. If you recover it all, there's a big cost of doing that. And it's often, it's not physically possible. So when we're looking at the, this diagram, what we have is, is the simple, the, the sulfide mineral recovery, or you can think about the, the percent, what's the, the percent of the metal that you've recovered. The vertical axis axis is the is really the grade. And just look at that black line. So when I want 100% recovery, which is at the 100% sign, sorry, the 100% recovery, uh, my grade is gonna be very low. And as I improve my recovery, um, sorry, as my recovery goes down, 
I'm actually having higher and higher grade. So meddler just work on a cost trade-off and they try to work around where that big curve inflection is on that or the change that change in slope really um, is on that curve because they do cost trade-off. It costs to recover more, but the more we recover, um, the more metal, sorry, the higher the recovery, the lower the grade. And so there's this balance back and forth and our mineralogical information actually goes into that. And so on, on there, you look at the, those little particles that are sitting there and those are just false colored image particles. The, the particles where I have the highest grade, but the lowest recovery are is when it's like sulfide only. And I just continue to add more and more gang to my particles as I go down that curve. So for a lot of the automated mineralogy work that we have to do for, for Geomet and the process plant side is really around, um, it's, it's SEM based, the automated quantitative mineralogy. And so most of us are familiar with MLAs, pen scans, or all their modern analogs, the way that we completely digitize from drill core samples um, down to the individual particle scale. And we require this data, metallurgist qualitative data for them, qualitative information or qualitative data is, is really not helpful to them. They need to ident they need the identity of all the major, minor, and trace minerals in your deposit. They need to know what the compositions of the minerals are that may impact on the extraction process. And they need quantitative data on, th on the mineral abundances, things like the particle grains and uh, the particle and grain dis size distributions, how those particles are going to start behaving as the ores get progressively crushed up down to you know things where they're less than 75 microns in size, because that's how they figure out what kind of process they're going to use to recover them. They need to know about the texture, you know, what impacts on big scale. Is it disseminated vein style or even massive? The mineral associations, which means actually how the minerals are actually touching each other the percent liberation, and then if there's any surface coatings. And the surface coatings become important because even a micron scale coating or submicron oxidized coating on a sulfide mineral will impact significantly on its ability to float. So when we're looking inside of uh, looking at deposits and we're doing um, logging, the top of oxidation is very important, but the base of complete oxidation is also important, but then also the base of partial oxidation. So think about that. Because even that part, by the time you get the base of partial oxidation, which is really the bottom of the supergene enriched blanket, you're still being, you're still impacting or potentially coating some of your mineral grains enough where you may not necessarily be able to, to see it easily, but it's impacting on the flotation response. Geologists, we deal with un, really unfragmented samples. Think of the drill core sticks or, or little tiny pieces of rock that we cut out and do a lot of detailed work on. But we, we need to think about, we need to work more on or understand what happens when we start crushing and milling these samples and think about how all of these minerals and the particles that the minerals are contained in, actually how they're behaving as they progressively go through the extraction process. Expiration process, you don't need to worry about so much on that side, but as we get closer into production, we do. Um, so most geologists are really unfamiliar with this process, but it's really around, you know, the applied mineralogy side. And it comes from, sorry, from the process mineralogy side that we're familiar with. Hopefully I have it. Have I dropped out? No, I'm okay. Sorry. No, all good. Okay, thank you. Um, off the... Again, geomet testing is around variability testing. When metallurgists come in and do big testing, uh, taking big bulk samples, they're doing testing at a variety of different conditions to come out with to come up with a proper final design, which means all the reagent schemes and, and all of that. So their idea at that point is really what the average or how it's going to respond allows them to do the tweaking of their process. But before that gets to that stage, they really need to understand what's going on for variability because the variability will dictate the operating windows that they designed that that plant to operate within. So they don't always, they're not designed for the average ore. There's an average ore plus or minus a certain window of variability in there. But then there's a point when you go outside of that variability. And what they try to do is look at the average for any kind of production period and design it 
at, to cover for, you know, 80 percentile of the ore, maybe even less, because it costs the more, the tighter that operating window, the higher the cost is going to be. So when we're doing our geomet testing, what we're trying to do, not do the details through every step along that stage, but do testing at a stage that's high enough to where we could do a, a, a balance across that whole metallurgical facility. So this little diagram is a very simplified flow sheet, incredibly simplified flow sheet uh, for the process at Olympic Dam where you go from milling and flotation, um, and you make a concentrate and you leach it, you do, uh, you have tailings and then what happens to tailings when, and then when you go tailings leach and finally into disposal from that and when your concentrate goes to the smelter. So from the geomet side, we actually describe that thing a little bit more detailed than that. But it's at the high level, not the individual little tiny subunits within that process plant. Geomet tests are done at a standard set of conditions. So we're looking to define the effect of the ore properties on the response not the detailed tweaking on a day-to-day -day basis that happens has to occur within metallurgy. Our goal is really to rank the blocks in the resource model because the blocks are the, the things that are go, we actually go into the mine plan. And that, so that's so that we can actually choose the best value options, but then understand all those properties as we come out with eventually a mine plan, which is a shuffling of that 3D ore body into a single dimension. And this is really a relative approach. And we do the geomet testing. Don't look at all those little things that are printed down there for a minute. At Olympic Dam, we have 50 geomet variables that we use to describe our overall process at Olympic Dam. And that means going from, from the mining side, but really once the ore hits that plant, to making five nines pure copper cathode, gold and silver bullion, and uranium ore concentrate, which all occurs at Olympic Dam itself. We, this level of information that we have is required. So that's addition, in addition to the normal geological and mineralogical assay and mineralogical information that goes in. And it's required to evaluate every single block and where we can assign value to every single block in the block model. So all of those little um, acronyms that we see across there are all the things that we end up having predictive algorithms that are based on the mineralogy and the assays of the rock. and and along with the MET testing that allows us to, to estimate everything that we need to know about that process at a high level to predict what the performance is gonna be and what's it gonna to cost to do it. Seems complicated, but it's really not. Feeding our data into the, re into the resource model eventually. You would have to think about the resource model and we talk, think about you know, the word digital twins is used a lot today, but the resource model is actually the digital twin of the geological, mineralogical, and metallurgical, physical, and geophysical variability across the deposit. And that the deposit means everything in it, any dirt that's going to get moved eventually, we need to know about it because we're either going to recover metal from it or we have to deal with the long-term closure issues with it when the stuff is sitting up on the surface. So in here, we need to really say that, you know, grade might always be keen when you're in an ore deposit, when in mine geology side, you know, grade always matters, but, min but mineralogy is almost as equal to that grade. And sometimes it's even more important than what the grade is. So our Olympic Dam approach, we utilize the power of that resource model. That resource model and our geological information will never have, we're never able to do that amount of assaying on individual samples that we do for the resource. So at Olympic Dam's case, you know, we, we, we have 3 million samples that have been assayed over the life of the deposit. But by the time we get down to the testing of it, we have details on 10,000 mineralogy samples, but then we also have metallurgical testing on, on, on 2,000. How can I populate a block model with that? Well, that's why we do all of these predictors, really. We link all the geomet predictors back to the parameters that are estimated in the block model. And this actually allows us, instead of just having two 2,000 geomet samples where we have full testing on it, we can actually relate all that back, back to the individual blocks in the block model and, and, and utilize that whole power of that information that we have there. And part of the thing that we learn about once we're making block models about some, some things behave in a, a, a additive, that they have additive properties or their, their geostats are actually linear. And then there's nonlinear behavior and physical properties 
are often or physical tests that or physical property response are actually behave in a nonlinear way, which means the geostats becomes a lot more difficult. So we, we have had a purpose early on to not try to populate or do um, geostatistical estimation of our limited variables across the deposit that's six kilometers long, but say we have to go back and get it down to a level where the, the geostats, standard geostatistics will actually work. And it's actually, the goal is really about simplicity, but simplicity, but still being useful enough for the business. Um, database, you know, it's data and the data that we have, but then how much that data needs to go on down through the process and we have to really pare it down. And so whether we have Geomet databases and even I said, we'd like to combine things and at Olympic Dam, our Geomet database and the resource database is all one and all the metallurgical testing gets all together. But the different components and there are, you know, that the, the Geomet model uses our drill hole assays, the predicted attributes, um, the, the measured attributes. So there's difference between predicted versus measured. And then eventually the past production attributes too, because those give us a little bit of guidance. Those information actually all go into the block model and then those goes into our Stoke database. And the Stoke database is our production, more of our production database, because that's what the, the mining engineers are actually using for their designing of, of, our, of our Stokes. And we have to deal with other disciplines. We've got to remember that, that metallurgists for a geologist are geologists really their best friends. Uh, mining engineers sometimes are a little bit more, a little bit more difficult because they just want to get the dirt out of the ground. And this is this is an overly simplistic statement about them. They their goal is to get the dirt out of the ground and get it out as most efficiently as possible. The metallurgists are the ones that have to deal with all the stuff that's being delivered that they didn't expect to be delivered. And and the metallurgists actually will help the geologists, potentially help the geologists on gaining funding to do more of this work because it impacts, all of this work impacts directly on them. However, you still need a realistic, relentless persistence actually pays off. For the mine planner, usually more geomet data just means, oh man, we're just going to have to you know, deal with more variables. No, nope, they actually don't really have to deal with that much more variables. They just need to carry those variables throughout the process so that those variables show up in the mine plan so that process design and metallurgy can actually uh, use that information. So we try to gain their trust as much as possible and don't make their workforce a lot more complicated. We're just embedding the geomet data into existing workflows. Uh, we want the geomet data to be carried all the way in the mine plan because that's the mine plan is what metallurgy actually uses, but carried through so the metallurgy can do more of their detailed uh, process tweaking that needs to be done. So our geomet attributes really help define the strategy um, because this high level view that we actually have of, 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 of the process which we could define. It also allows us to define stopes or if we're in an open pit situation, just normal movement of ore around. It helps define the stopes and, and the ultimate schedule, which allows us to optimize the plant outputs. And we also have to make sure that no matter what models we come out with, you know, there's a, a guy that box an old a statistician that had all models are wrong. Some models are useful. So we try to make our stuff as useful as possible, but we actually have to validate. So once you're in production, it's easier to validate your predictors and the, and the validation process is actually called reconciliation. And, and we use that because we actually have to understand how good are our predictors. So as, as summarizing, summarizing all this up, that as geologists, mineralogy always matters from expiration to closure. And as geologists, we know the most about mineralogy than anybody else in the in the um, in our in our business cycle actually understands it. A lot of the geomet principles that we have is not actually asking the geologists to do a lot more. It's just asking them to think about how we can quantitative quantitate or turn our qualitative data into more quantitative data, and that's possible these days. You know, when when should we start really thinking about geomet, geomet you, know, you know, and that includes the ore to final products, including low-grade waste and tailings, and when should that stuff ex 
um, when, would sh when should we start thinking about it? And it's really post the discovery hole. We don't need the extreme details that we need when we're close at production, but still that kind of thing in our, our mind. The technology exists now to characterize mineralogy across the entire deposit at an unprecedented scale compared to even a decade ago. It's moving quickly. Um, ore body knowledge continues to grow as the data is progressively collected on the mineral deposit as you go from your discovery to eventual production. Data and the subsequent information that's generated that's, um, that we that we derive from that data should not be restricted to the person who gathered that data. It's likely useful to other disciplines. And we really have to say that I can come out with recipes for what we do at Olympic Dam, but that's not the purpose of this. There are certain things that we need across no matter what GMET program we're working on. And, but it needs to be fit for purpose for your own deposit. What we might do for a deposit that's only gonna be around for five years versus a deposit that's gonna be around for plus 50 years is different. Our business requirements are different for, for each of us too. So the path that you go down depends on your deposit and ultimately your business requirements. So as a final conclusion, um, it's all about minerals, 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 and really start thinking going from as geologists from qualitative mineralogy to quantitative mineralogy, because we really need to edit the deposit scale. You need to understand how mineralogy impacts on the mining cycle from discovery to closure, and that actually helps you um, cost justify what you're doing more. Often when we try to cost justify back in the geology side, or let me, let me rephrase that, when we're in a process, the closer I get to final product, the easier it is to cost justify something. So in the refinery, the metallurgist can simply say, if I change the, the amount of amps that are going into the, into the refinery, which controls the growth rate, that equals X amount of electricity, which equals X amount of dollars, which means, and then equate, equate that exactly to the amount of metal. If we think then we go back, as we go back towards geology side, that window is getting a little bit wider on how much information you have to, to um, put into a cost justification for it. It becomes very difficult about a geology because they say, yeah, I can do a little bit of this information. It's not necessarily going to impact for 20 years. Difficult to cost justify. If you can equate the qu doing quantitative mineralogy and have metallurgical support for it, back to what you're trying to do right now is gathering the right data so that we can actually make quant have quantitative data that actually has business value. But based on geology alone, that's difficult to quantify. That's where you need the help from the metallurgist. And actually by understanding what's going on down the process and how these minerals impact on it, that helps justify what you're doing a lot better. We need to embed mineralogy and metallurgical data into the resource and reserve models because they're the fundamental inputs into the mine planning process planning and believe me even once you start after you have your discovery hole and you've had a few other holes and and you in your in a company there's projects people with mine mining engineers and and process engineers they're already planning a, a mine plan for that deposit even before odds are that you have a real block model for that and, and they're also planning what that process. Now, th those will change a lot as it goes along, but you need to have that kind of information early on. You need to, but as geologists, we, we have a very sophisticated technical language that, that our mining engineers and metallurgists actually don't necessarily understand. So we actually have to learn to be more effective at communicating to non-geoscience disciplines across our deposit. So when we talk about alteration types to them, often, some metallurgists are very enlightened on what argillic alteration actually means as far as minerals, but most of them aren't. And so you have to say, you know, that this, I, I'm talking about specific minerals. And if you change your, your language to more specific minerals, that actually helps them a lot and it helps them appreciate more what you're doing. Um, this I always like this view. It's an old one of Olympic Dam because we still have our uh, the shaft in the background, and that shaft has been decommissioned. We have the other ones in the ground. But at Olympic Dam, this is our core processing area, and we stole all of our core. It's nice and flat, set out in the middle of the desert in Australia. And we have more than 3 million meters of diamond core that we can effectively store that survived last the length of time. And we have even the first drill hole that was ever drilled at Olympic Dam is still there. 
that is actually, it's a beautiful library for when we have to go test work, we can go back and test. We don't necessarily test stuff that's 30 years ago for sulfide recoveries, but we can do leaching tests on that. But this still gives us access. We have all of that core we can pull out and look at again, but we also have it for, it's on our hands for metallurgical testing. So just one final quote, that metal has no value in, until it's a sellable product. That again, is from one of our metallurgical friends. And thank you, um, and that's it for today. Thank you so much, Katie, for this insightful presentation. I enjoyed every second of it. Um, could you please stop sharing the screen? Thank you so much. So now we're going ahead with the Q&A section for your presentation. I'm gonna proceed by reading uh, the first question here. It says, in terms of geometallurgy point of view, sometimes in the deposit there are potential of lots of critical raw materials in it, which you usually overlook. How can we enhance this in a view of geometallurgy so the interesting or is not gonna end up in the tailings or a slack faces? Yep, uh, that's, that's, that's a topic that is brought up an awful lot these days, you know, and because we're focused on uh, more of the metals that are critical to our, our society going forward and particularly the energy transition that we have to go through. Number one, we can only recover what's, frankly, what's economically viable to do that. And economically viable depends on the process, but it also depends on what that metal price is. And you have to have a process to get it out. As the, as the metals become more, as, as there's processes or there's extraction methodology that's applicable to extracting those metals, we look at them. We also look at them before then, but but we also look at them to the future as a business. We we ask ourselves is if there's not an existing technology that can economically extract those metals out, how what do we need to invest in to make those processes or to design a process that becomes economic? Um, it's it's an incredibly important question. The best thing we can do as geologists is to make sure and be, because we can do these now is to assay for most of the elements that you can. You know, that really matters because as commodity prices change and opportunities out there actually change, if we don't know what they are at a level back in the ore body, we need to have some idea what's going on. And often in our deposits, we don't. So uh, at Olympic Dam, because we've assayed for so many elements for so long, we know that Olympic Dam is probably the world's second largest rare earth deposit. You say, well, why aren't we recovering rare earths? This is where the mineralogy matters. The minerals are less than 10 microns in size, and they're not amenable to existing processes that are available right now. But that doesn't mean we're not thinking about it. So it, it's all of this, making sure that we have the information back. So if I didn't assay for rare earths at all, we'll just use that for an example. And all of a sudden, the price of rare earths even went up higher. And the, the demand just even increased anymore because that's reflected in the price. Then, then we'd have to say, and we know from some metallurgical samples that, yeah, there's rare earths in them. I couldn't tell you what it is in the ore body. We can because we do that, but a lot of people don't even know what their critical metals are and in their back in their ores. It takes a long time to go from, like saying, have a few isolated samples where you have full detail. It takes a long time if you have to go back and post and pull out all your old drill core or old assay pulps and actually get that information. So it's really... It's even more critical these days to assay for as many elements as you can, because at least you'll know they're there. Tailings. Tailings, I have to t uh, tell a lot of people, it's not stuff you're throwing away. It's stuff that's not economic right now to extract from, you know, and it contains a, it, it contains a lot of gang minerals, but then there's also potentially economic. That material has already been mined. It's brought up to the surface. It's been ground down. There's been a lot of things already stripped out of it, but it's material for future for that we can extract from the future, you know? So it's not, we're not getting rid of it. So we really have to think tailings are, are a thing that we have to deal with just because the amount of space they take up on the surface, but we're not throwing that ore deposit away. Frankly, they're still sitting up there and they're easier to extract from than if we had to go back and mine. So 
people that do go back and reprocess their tailings, um, they reprocess old tailings. They're not reprocessing new tailings because the grades with time, you know, have have the old tailings had higher grades in them. So they're they're not bad. They're not bad to do. But it's a it's a very good question. That the stuff is sitting there, and most places, if if the geologists and metallurgists know what's in their ore bodies, um, and and the metallurgist that that the the whole side will be looking at how we could potentially extract them. And the bigger the company is, the more the agile you're trying to think, you know, what potential metal might come online that we can make money from. So, this, but this is important because geologists are the biggest drivers of that, knowing the the concentration of those metals back in their ore body. Even better is if you know the minerals. So, yeah, very yeah, good question. I re I really like what you said. Like it's not economically feasible right now, but who knows in the future. And yeah. so another question moving on, Nicole Hoffman says, any recommendation on a database that can host geologic and metallurgic data? I keep trying mm. to show that data into my geologic database from different players. So any yeah. suggestions for our viewers yeah. today? Yeah. Um, we built, we, we use Acquire, and, and this is not a recommendation that Acquire anything, so it's not saying use it. We use, we, when we were developing our Geomet database, the important thing, I'll just use my hands for a minute. The important thing is most geological data is relatively flat. You know, we have the drill hole. Uh, we take a sample out of that. We assay it, you know, so it's relatively flat. By the time you're doing a metallurgical testing, you have the parent sample. Um, I'll get it closer to my camera here, parent sample. And then we have a whole tier of samples that are coming off of that, going down. And most of the geological databases aren't really set up for this whole mega hierarchy of samples that all relate ultimately back to a single sample. But you have to worry about all these sub products that are being produced uh, when you're doing the metallurgical testing, particularly when you do a flotation and then leaching and then all kinds of things following that. We had to build a bespoke Geomet database for that, but it was within Acquire because we were already using Acquire and I had a database person doing that. We are openly sharing the structure that we've done with, with people. Is it available? Is it publicly available? No, but sorry, is it commercially available? No, but we are happy to share with anybody that wants to email me and ask me about database and what we do We've, we've published some stuff on it, but we're happy to share with people. But it, it's it's a big deal because our ge our, the standard databases out there that, that geologists typically use aren't really set up for that, but they have the ability to do it. Just take somebody to go in and do the programming for it. So it's possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, following the, on that, Kathy, would you like to share your email for people with the audience once we are done with the question? In, in in, in if they want to ask you in the chat the I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll put it in the chat is that okay yeah. yes thank you yeah thank yeah. you so much so I'm going to move on to another question and it's from Sarah Belfield it say how soon after a discovery holds show folks explore uh, show folks exploring for a, an IOCG style or body be ascertaining the abundance and location of any radioactive minerals faces present in or near the mineralization. Yeah, uh, the, the, the first thing you need to do is make sure you assay for uranium. If you're in an IOCG, um, you should be assaying for uranium and thorium, but it's usually uranium is more of a problem. So your assaying right away will tell you how potentially big a problem might be off of there. Um, and so you start with that assaying side Usually the uranium mineralogy in an IOCG, the uranium minerals, the geologist never sees them in by, with hand lens. You know, that, that's incredibly rare. It's very, they're usually pretty fine grain, so it's difficult. And so you have to go through and, and start doing it once you really know you have the deposit, trying to understand what the uranium minerals are in there, and you have to do some detailed mineralogy off of that. It should happen as soon as you start knowing that you have uranium in your deposit, in drill core samples, probably greater than about 50 ppm, you better start looking for it because you need to understand whether the uranium is going to go along with your sulfides, let's say if it's in a base metal deposit, or if it's going to go out with your gang minerals. It goes out with gang minerals is not a problem. It's a problem if it goes into your sulfides because if your sulf, they recover to the concentrate that you sell out on the open market, the smelters in the world will only take uranium up to a certain level and then they just don't take it anymore. And that's actually why we have to smelt at Olympic Dam. It is a big concern, but 
but you start by assaying uranium and then doing some quantitative mineralogy as soon as you start knowing that, that you have really about, more than about 50 ppm. Yeah. Thank you so much. So now we have a question from Alan. I guess backtesting to verify relationship of data to recovery is part of the process? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point. So how do we actually know, besides trying to do a reconciliation at Olympic Dam, you know, on a month-to-month -month basis, when we say, once we know what was delivered to the plant, what would we predict versus what was the outcome? We also have the benefit in an operation is metallurgists take composite samples, monthly composite samples from all their critical points in their plant every month. And that means there's a physical sample that gets assayed, but we then go through off of that, we'll do the, um, we, it's already been ground, so we, we can't do it anymore, but we can take those samples that feed the flotation, the tailings, then go out to tailings that feed the smelter. And we can go back and do flotation tests off of those to see actually what our flotation test in the lab off of that sample that was produced for the month, how did that actually perform against what the plant actually did? So that's part of our back validation process. Same things for our tailings and our tailings leach. We take a sam we have a monthly sample, a composite sample of what the monthly material was that went in through that plant. We take it in, into the lab. We do the leaching off it using our geomet leaching protocols and see how that actually compared against the plant. So that is an integral part when you're in an operation is being able to tap into um, those monthly composite samples that almost all metallurgical plants collect anyway. You know, there's a geologist you may not be aware, but they actually collect them and you can utilize those too. And so that helps us back um, uh, validate our, our process predictors. And I hope that was answering the question in the way that the, the, ask, the asker it wanted, so. Yeah, I think I think it's a good answer. So um, there are like a lot of questions for you, Kathy. I'm going to go yeah. through you, some of them. You, you, choose, um, you uh, choose which ones. Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, uh, it says, does VP or an example for a link them make photogra photographic records of all core as they are drilled and perhaps other more advanced methods like hyperspectral imaging? Yeah, yep. Uh, good question. They, from the drilling of RD1, all core has always been photographed. Now you think back in RD1 was drilled and the, the discovery hole, the first hole Olympic Dam was drilled in 1975. They had 35 millimeter cameras. There was no such thing as digital cameras back then. And we had 35 millimeter slides. So back then it was a standard practice at WMC. They photographed their core and they assayed it. They assayed all of the core, um, not to the same level of, of, of frequency, but they assayed everything. So they knew it was in there. So there were that, that, that work practice was embedded from day one really at Olympic Dam. Which is which is fantastic because it we just just do it always, in a modern sense when digital cameras became available we start doing digital images, um, we take high resolution digital images right now. Off of scanning, we'll we'll jump to the scanning side in a minute. We will eventually move as soon as our we have a very old core processing area, and we are trying to uh, embed new workflows that allow us to take even higher resolution imaging because we know we need that. Um, and that'll also help future proof some of the stuff that we're working on now. Other scanning that we do, and, and I'll, I'm gonna be a little bit arrogant here. Um, I Long ago, I developed a, a, an algorithm where I can take the assays and convert those to mineralogy, actual weight percent mineralogy that's far better than the, the geologist can ever predict. You know, They just can't do that. So that, so any of the new technology that comes along has to get over that hurdle of being able to provide me better estimate or better quantification of the minerals that I can already do based on the assaying and that that's already then, then that's validated by very detailed mineralogy that we did a lot later. Hyperspectral is a fantastic tool in, in rocks that you have a lot of clay minerals that are light color and just think about it, it's, it's looking at the light reflections. Once the rocks start getting dark, and in our case, growing about 20% iron in the rock, the signal swamp too much, it becomes useless to us, you know, frankly. Um, 
But when we're out in the granites or out in the areas of the deposit that have less hematite alteration or iron oxide alteration, it does help resolve the, the sericites and chlorites. But, you know, frankly, an assay is going to do that for me, too. And, and, and we have to look at it in an operation, the cost of it, the cost of an assay. And if I'm going to bring a new technology in, and let's say even a scanning XRF, and this is our deposits different than others, and scanning XRF, so I don't want to say a technology is bad because it's not. If it can't do all the elements that I currently do, that as soon as I have to assay, sample that core and assay for one element, that any new technology, if it can't replace all the elements that I'm doing, it's an extra cost. And so if it's an extra cost, it has to have an added benefit. And, and for us, having the information quicker is actually because where most of our drilling is occurring more than three years in advance of mining. So we don't have to have that information right now. That's very different than when you need the information a lot more quickly. So, and this, it was a good question is because when do you start putting in automated scanning technology? Number one, it has to actually be a benefit to you. And, and hyperspectral, I wish it worked for us because that would make some of my life a little bit easier off of things, but it, it actually, it, 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 it doesn't, it works out more of an expiration sense if you need that. Um, we are moving as, as technology is improving and it's changing not almost every day, but almost that, that quickly. All of these instrumentation that were in the past that provided qualitative information. So hyperspectral in particular is a, just a good example, but there's same that applies to most of them. Hyperspectral is not sensitive to all the minerals. It's sensitive to a certain suite of minerals, and it'll tell you a relative abundance of all those minerals. You have to turn and then use, you can use machine learning in a, in a modern sense to go back and then quantify that stuff, and that's happening. And, and other technologies that are out there, you have to be aware, particularly when they're sensing minerals, do, do, they, do they detect all of your minerals? If they don't detect all of your minerals, it may or may not help you, but you have to make that decision, so... It's a good question. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for your input. Um, we are running out of time, but I'm gonna choose one last question here. And I would like to see is more on the learning side and it's from Owen Chingo. I hope I said it right. And it says, at what learning stage? Undergrad or postgraduate should geomet models be tough or like I enter interpret this like when should we start learning about this which is essential for early career like yeah when yeah it, it's interesting i've been on a lot of curriculum curriculum reviews for uh the australian different australian universities throughout time and it, it's always it's interesting where where should we learn how to use software i am not a believer that the university is the place to teach us how to use software the university is a place to teach us how to think. And then also um, the, the fundamentals of the work that we do. As, so as geologists, obviously we need to know about mineralogy, we need to know about structure, we need to know about how ore deposits form and, and all, all of the stuff that's associated with being a geologist. What we do need to know is some of the, the What's good for an early exposure is when are we exposed to geomet or when are we exposed to uh, even metallurgy, you know? And it, it could be part, a sub part of a course, you know, to say yeah. these are the fundamental things that we're learning about, but this is where the potential applications are out in, out in industry, you know, and particularly the, the, that's to say focus on industry. The same things as a geologist early on, we need to know what the environmental impacts of what we're doing. And we also need to understand how, as geologists, that we can quantify all the work that we're doing to understand what's going to environmentally happen once we're up on the surface, too. So all of the other streams where our data is used, it's important for somebody else to know. To, to, to know. I personally, because I am a scientist that actually works in industry, and remember, I'm, I'm a scientist, I want the university to know to... To teach my to teach people how to think and how to be a good geologist, you know, a smart a right. smart technical person, I can teach them how to drive the software within weeks, you know, once they're in the industry. So, teach learn as much as you can in university, 
and the methodologies that are available and, and be open-minded and that's the best thing we can do. So it's, it's, it's around, it can be done. Uh, master courses are, are good pl places for that. So a lot of the, uh, several of the universities are having master courses that are open. Those are great things to get on too. Yeah. Fantastic. I agree 100% with you, Kathy. This was mm. fabulous. And I'm sorry we cannot cover all the questions that are in the Q&A section, but if you spare some time, you can go back and check them and probably reply to the public. We will appreciate okay. that. Thank you again for being here. I really like this space that you shared with us. And now I want to announce that we have a quick break and let, so everyone can relax, take some time, recharge energy, and please come back because after the, way, the break, we will have more talks and so far so good. So we will have more of this. So please come back. See you later. And sorry, I forgot to say, be here at 25 after the hours and we'll be starting right on time. Please be aware of that.
Okay, we are ready to start again. And now we are going to move on to our president, Stuart Simon. Simon, sorry. Um, he's going to talk uh, about the last year. And Dr. Stuart Simons is the current president of the Society of Economic Geologists. He's a well-respected consulting geologist and research professor at the University of Utah with a notable focus on epithermal gold, silver mineral deposits, and geothermal resources. Stuart research is geared towards comprehending the geological, hydrogeological, and geochemical factors that control hydrothermal fluid flow, precious metal mineralization, and heat transfer. With an MS and PhD in economic geology from the University of Minnesota, Stuart has spent a significant portion of his career at the Geothermal Institute, University of Auckland, based in New Zealand. Additionally, he has worked as a consultant to the mineral and geothermal industries and has gained extensive experience working around the Pacific Rim, including recent work in New Zealand, Chile, and the Western United States. It's my pleasure to invite Stuart to join us and provide the 2023 summary comments. Uh, thanks, Valeria. Uh, I'm almost embarrassed. That uh, took longer to say than what I'm going to share with you right now. But uh, anyhow, that was uh, very nice of you. Look, uh, it's a pleasure participating in the symposium in which we celebrate the traveling lecturers. And it's great to see such a great turnout online. We've heard two fantastic talks. And there are two more to come. So thanks to the speakers for their outstanding presentations and the two to come. I really have just but a few thoughts. And uh, uh, mostly, I just want to express thanks. 2023 for the SEG has been a year of transition. Significantly, we mourned the loss of Brian Hole, our long-serving executive director. And we welcomed his successor, Jennifer Craig. Many have contributed to the process, but I especially want to acknowledge the Littleton SEG staff and Jennifer for making it as seamless as possible. We also shook off the after effects of the COVID pandemic and held what proved to be a highly successful London conference. So deep thanks to Bob Foster, the organizing committee, the presenters, and all those who attended and just contributed to what really was a fantastic experience. I there's more change uh, coming. We're currently looking for, uh, we're sorry, we're currently undertaking a search for a new editor of our flagship journal, Economic Geology, to succeed Larry Minert, uh, who announced earlier this year that he was stepping down. He's not exiting just yet, uh, and he's promised to be around next year to help uh, the new editor as they bed in. Uh, but we are certainly grateful for all of his hard work. Uh, and we expect to be able to announce the new editor uh, sometime early in 2024. Uh, the last thing I need to say is uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, there's going to be a change in the executive. I have but two or three weeks left in the role as president, and I want to thank everyone for the support provided this year. I'm looking forward to handing over the reins to, to the incoming president, Steve Piercy, who you'll be hearing from a little bit later on, and also welcoming Ann Thompson, who picks up the role as president-elect. And, and most importantly, I just want to acknowledge Chico Azevedo, who finishes his three-year term. I know I speak for the whole society in extending our deepest thanks for your contributions. Valeria, I'm going to turn this back over to you, and uh, you're doing a great job. So thanks so much. Thanks to you, Stuart, for being here with us. This is always a good place to share this news with, us, with all of the people that is here. So thank you so much. And now I'm going to move on to sharing um, the information about Professor Xiao Yong Yang. He is our SEG Re Regional Vice President Lecturer. And Dr. Xiao Yong Yang is a professor of economic geology and geochemistry at the China, China University of Geosciences, CUG, in Wuhan, China. He's currently the assistant president of the CUG Wuhan and director of the Innovative Research Center for Exploration of Strategic Mineral Resources. 
Professor Yang graduated from Peking University in 1984 with a BS degree. In 1987, with an MS degree, he received his PhD degree from Bristol University, UK in 1996, and then worked at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Germany as a humble fellow and postdoctoral researcher from 1997 to 1999. He joined Nanjing University in 1999 as a full professor and act as the director of the State Key Laboratory of Mineral Deposit Research in Nanjing for 10 years. He joined CUG Wuhan in 2013. Professor Yan is an outstanding Chinese geologist in the field of geochemistry of mineral deposits. He has published more than 300 papers in international peer-reviewed journals, including Nature, Geology, and Economic Geology, and is recognized by Elsevier as a highly cited scholar in earth and planetary sciences from 2014 until nowadays. So it's my honor to pass it on to Dr. Sa Xiao Yan, Yong Yan. Thank you for being here. Dr. Yan, yeah. is, yeah. is, is everything okay for yes. sharing your presentation? Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Now, now the presentation is sharing. Is everything okay on the screen? Uh, no, not on my end. But I already sharing the, the... Let me check it again. Yeah. Now we got it. No. Yeah, now I see your screen, but not the presentation yet. No. Now there it is. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, should we start? Good morning, everyone. Yeah. I know it is afternoon in the United States, but it is early morning in China. Many thanks to Venera who just introduced me. And my name is Sao Yun Jiang from China University of Geoscience in Wuhan. It is my great pleasure to serve as the regional vice president lecturer in this year. My talk today is geological characteristics and the genetic types of rare metal deposits in China. In this talk, I will first very briefly introduce the geological characteristics of rare metal deposits in China. Then, I will move to the main body of this talk, namely the new types of rare metal deposits we are currently working on in China. In China, we define the critical metal deposit into four catalogs, namely the four rare metals deposits. The first group is rare metal elements, including lithium, barium, niobium, tantalum, zirconium, hafnium, strontium, rubidium, cesium, tin, and tungsten. The second group is rare earth elements, including the 15 rare earth elements plus Eicher and Scandium. The third group, we call it rare dispersed elements, include India, Galleon, Galleon and Syria, and so on. The fourth group, we call it rare precious metals and others, including the platinum group elements, chromium, cobalt, etc. Today, I will only focus on the rare metal element deposit. 
in particular Silesian, Leobin, Tantalan, and Sicil. In China, we define the large scale deposit of lithium and niobium when the lithium oxide or the niobium oxide are larger than 100,000 tons. Those between 10,000 and 100 tons are medium size, and those less than 10,000 tons are small size. The cutoff grade for lithium oxide is 0.6%, for the orbing oxide is 0.02%. For tantalum, the large size deposits are larger than 1,000 tons. The medium size are between 500 to 1,000 tons, and the small size are usually less than 500 tons. The cutoff grade for the tantalum oxide is 0.01%. The rare metal deposits are widely distributed in China, but different rare metals show different distribution, mostly concentrated in several metallogenic beds within China. All these deposits have different ore grade and the reservoirs but generally, most of them are very low-grade ores. The South China is one of the most important areas for rare metal deposits, with mostly the highly fractionated greenlight type and the pigmented type, including, for example, the giant only greenlight type Lysia tantalum niobium deposit, and the Sun Su Gang and the Huangshan greenlight type niobium and tantalum deposit. Also, the recently found Rongli pigmented type tantalum niobium and lysia deposit. In those China, we also have several important highly fractionated greenlight type rare metal deposit such as the Sufei Yao, Rubitin, Tantanin, Liobin, Berry, and Lishu deposit, and the Zhao Jingge, Rubitin, Tantanin, Liobin deposit. Also, the Barzer, Arkin, Greenlight type, Liobin, Deconin, Halfling, Berry, and the Rails deposit. The Bayan Obo deposit is a well known, super large carbonate type. Liobi and the rare earth deposit, and also in South Qinling area, they are Biao Ya and Sa Xintong, carbonatite type, Liobi and the rare earth deposit, and recently, several alkaline volcanic rock hosted Liobi, Tantalin, and the rare earth deposit are also found in this bed. The other type is the most well known pigmentite type lithium and barium deposit in China. And recently, many pigmentite type lithium deposit are found in the West Kunlun bed and also in the West Sichuan bed. Regarding the all types of rare metal deposit in China, the most common types are greenlit type and the pigmented type. Other types, including the arcanine greenlight type, the carbonatite type, and the volcanic rock type, and also some small and medium scale hydrosomal type of rare metal deposit. There are different metal associations, including the niobium tantalum only, the niobium rails combination, the zirconium deposit, the lithium deposit, Baron deposit and the Rubinian deposit. But most commonly, it is a combination of several different rare metals together, such as the lithium, baron, rubidium, cesium deposit, the leobium, tantalin, zirconium, halfin deposit, and also the tungsten, tin, and the leobium, tantalin deposit. They are 
many factors that may affect the formation of rare metal deposits. But the most important continuing factors, including the highly fractionated nature of the granite, and also the close related to extensional tectonics and metamorphic core complex. They are high fractionated feature are related to magmatic evolution itself. And the extensional tectonics and the metamorphic core complex are related to the tectonic activity. Here is an example from South China, the Yichun Super Large Leisure Leobin and Tantalon deposit. This is a highly fractionated granite type deposit. In this deposit, we can see a good fractionation trend from the two micro granite to muscovite granite to arbite granite and then to the topaz lipidolite arbite granite. And the topaz lipidolite arbite granite is the main ore body in this deposit. We also found the formation of many granite type and pigmented type rare metal deposits are closely related to the extensional tectonics and metamorphic core complex. This is a general model for the metamorphic core complex with formation of the thin tectonic green light and the pigment height. Along the cell zone and the mini light zone, we can see there are some hydrosomal fluid activity, and this may contribute to some rare metal deposit formation in this metamorphic core complex and in the shell zones. For example, the super large Yichun green type rare metal deposit, it is related to the Wugongsan metamorphic core complex. During the development of the Wugongsan metamorphic core complex, the crust extension causes the granite intruded and the granite are fractionated a long time. From the less fractionated granite, the two micro granite, up to the highly fractionated granite, the lipidolite, arbite granite. And the ore body are mostly located in the most highly fractionated lipidolite, arbite granite in the unit four. This is the open pit of the super large Eastern Lysia tantalum neobin deposit. The ore minerals in this deposit include the lipidolite, columbite, tantalite, and the neobin tantalum rich cassiterite. The lithium pigmentite in the West Quinlan and the Sumpangans Barrett in the loss of the Tibetan platen. For example, the large Bailunsan Dahong Liu Tan pigmentite deposit, and also the Jiajika Marakam pigmentite lithium deposit in West Sichuan. In the West Sichuan province, there are four metamorphic core complex. Some research also call it as light stone, including the Changzhen, Rongxika, Wado, and the Jiajika. The Jiajika deposit is currently exploited that reveal the super large pigmentite lithium deposit in this area. In the Jiajika deposit, along with the formation of the greenlight dome, there occur many pigmentite dikes, not only in the granite, but also widely dispersed in the metamorphic country rocks. 
Here are some photos for some typical old minerals in the geological pigmentite, including the spodium, the barium, and the niobium tantalum oxide. Now we move to the second part, the new types of rare metal deposit in China. In this part, I will introduce three new types of rare metal deposit, which are currently working on, including the large Yusan, Liobin, Tantalin, Zikonin, Hoflin, and Rails deposit in Northwest China. We call it as a lipitolite type rare metal deposit. The second one is the large Velasto lesion team polymetallic deposit in Inner Mongolia, North East China. We call it as hydrosomal crypto explosive bridge pipe type lithium deposit. And the third one is the hot spring type silicious silicon deposit in C zone. First, I will introduce the large Yusan rare metal deposit. Our study shows the Yusan rare metal deposit is likely the metamorphic counterpart of the alkaline volcanic rocks related to the rare metal deposit. We call it as lipid light type, which is the name mostly used in China and possibly also in Russia. But the Western countries may call it as local lice type deposit. The Yusan deposit is located in the most west end of the central Chilean orogenic bed near the Argin Fort. In this deposit, the old bed, which starts from here to here, can extend over 10 kilometers, and the widest of the orbit are more than 300 to 1 kilos wide. The old reservoirs for the Niobium titanium oxide is up to 280,000 tons with average grade of 0.1%. The major old minerals include columbite, tantalite, fixonite, arsenite, polyclase, bustalite, monazite, and also zika and the thorite. The drilling in this deposit erode several ore bodies in the depths, such as the limbo one ore body and the limbo two ore body, and also the limbo nine ore body, limbo ten, limbo seven, and the limbo fifteen ore body. All these ore bodies extend into the depths and allow without enough drain, deep draining control. This is the outcrop of the Russo sand deposit. As we can see, the lipitolite layer are with full control with the marble and also with the amphibolite. The color of the lipitolite vary from light laminated and more dark laminated. In the lipitolite, the magnetite, the smooth vein, are often observed. And the more the magnetite, the richer the ores. You can also see some amphibolite, which is interbate with the lipitolite. Also, we can see some of the later quartz veins in the lipitolite, and some of these quartz veins are gold content. Away from the shale zone, there also occur the metamorphic volcanic rocks of metal sediment strata. Here is the picture for the old minerals, including the bustalite, sinkersite, pyrosite, and also zircon and rutile. The rutile and tantalite are mostly niobium and the tantal rays. They are closely associated with the magnetite and the zirconium. 
we carry out a detailed zirconium uranium lead dating, and the date we wrote four groups of A's. For the unmineralized liptolite, the major age is 830 million years in the new Proterozoic times. Later on, in the 790, there is a metamorphic overprint to this unmineralized liptolite. Then, in the early Proterozoic times, we have the 490 million years age for the mineralized liptolite. Then we also have 455 million years for some of the rain of the zircons and all some new formed zircons in the mineralized liptolite. The magnetite in the unmineralized and the mineralized liptolite, they show remarkably different metal concentrations. Those associated with the mineralization usually have a very high concentration of a number of all metals, such as niobium, tantalum, zirconium, tin, and the rare earths. And the unmineralized liptolite, all these elements are contrastly lower than the mineralized In this table, we compared the usual sand deposit with those alkali volcanic rock has the rare metal deposit. For example, those in New South West in Australia and the Queensland in Australia, and also in South Chinning orogenic bed in Central China, including the Todi Ling and the Taobao rare metal deposit. All these deposits, they share quite similar geological and geochemical characteristics. In the major elements and the trace element describing diagram, the proteins of the Uyghur sand liptolite, all these red circles of pantolite Trochite and andosite, which are similar to those arcanic volcanic rock type rare metal deposit in Australia and also in South Chinese orogenic belt. This diagram shows the rocks that are all belong to the alkali series. And these three diagrams show all these rocks are occurred in the within plant tectonic settings, not only for the Yusu sand deposit, but also for those in South Chile of Central China and in Australia, those volcanic volcanic rock associated. When compared, the all metals in the Yusu sand deposit with other alkali volcanic rock type deposit. They are similar, but the Uyghur sand deposit has those metals mostly at the lower end, except for the eastern concentration in the Uyghur sand deposit, which are higher than most of the alkali volcanic rock type rare metal deposit. In conclusion, we propose a two-stage mineralization model for the Uyghur sand rare metal deposit. In the Neoproterozoic Neoprot time, at the age of 813, the essential mantle upwelling caused the eruption of the alkali volcanic rocks. And these alkali volcanic rocks with some initial enrichment of Leobin, Tantalin, and the rare earth. And later on, in the 790 million years, there is a small metamorphic overprint which may 
you set some of the uranium dating of the seconds in the rings, then in the only Panasonic time in 490 million years, the large cell zone occurred here with partial melting of the thin tectonic rocks and also the cell zone which contributes to the immobilization of the rain metal element from the alkali volcanic rocks into the lipidolite. And later on in the 455, there are some overprint of later metamorphic activities. Therefore, we turned the used sand deposit represent the metamorphic counterpart of the alkali volcanic rock related rare metal deposit in the world. So we propose it is a new type or new subtype of rare metal deposit and we turn it as a lipidolite type, the orbin tantalum deposit. Now we move to the hydrosomal Crypto explosive bridge pipe type lithium deposit. The Velasto lithium tin polymetallic deposit in Inner Mongolia, North East China. There are generally three main types of lithium deposits in the world. The first type is the greenite and the pigmentite type. For example, those in Australia. Australia, the green booth, and also in South China, for example, the Yichun and the Jajika deposit, and also in the Manono Kitola deposit. The second important type is the brown and the salt lake type, including those in South American salas, and also those in Chatham in West China. The third important type of lithium deposit is the clay type. Only this year, Benson reported in Science Advance the hydrosomal enrichment of lithium in intro colored elite bearing clay stones, which is the famous McDermott colored. In this deposit, the all grade can up to 1% of lithium and the estimated tonnage of between 20 to 40 million tons of lithium and it can reach up maximum to 120 million tons of lithium in this area. The bridge pipe type deposits are widely distributed in the world. In particular, Included the tin and tungsten deposit, gold deposit, and the lead zinc deposit. Here is a typical conception model for the bridge pipes with the underlist igneous intrusive. And during the later stage gathering of gas and fluorite, then they can form the fluidized metamorphosized bridge with the cryptal explosion bridge main body here and the cryptal bridge in the upper part. There are also some later fracture filled with veins. This is a good example. We started in, Xin, in Jiangxi province of South China. And in this tungsten deposit, we have a number of different type of tungsten deposits, including the hydrosomal bridge pipe type deposit in this deposit. The Velasto lithium tin polymetallic deposit located in the Indo Mongolia, Northeast China. In this mining area, we have the Velasto tin and lithium deposit here. And also we have the copper and zinc deposit not far away from the tin lithium deposit. And also we have the silver lead zinc deposit here. 
And here is the plain view of the bridge of pipes. And you can see from the cross section, there is a underlayed granite. And in the roof zone of the granite, we can see some of the tin and the rubidium mineralization. Then we have the crypto explosive bridge pipes with lithium concentration of 357,000 tons with the lithium ore grade average at 1.28%. In the velocity deposit, the green light is an occurring feasible green light. In this green light, we can also see some sulfide and the cassiterite cloud, which dissimulate the topaz and the other oil minerals. And the muscovite are mostly silver diet, which is a lithium rich micros. Also, we can see some of the small veins of coarse silver diet in the roof zone of the alkaline feedspot green light. And here is the uh, picture for the Jingwa diet with other minerals. And also we can see a lot of uh, columbite and uh, tantalite minerals together with the Jingwa diet. And also in the sulfide and cassiterite cloud in the green light, we can see a closely association of the cassiterite with other sulfide minerals. When we look at the bridge pipe in the Velasco deposit, you can see the zinc and the quartz and also some of the arbite is the matrix, which is the metamorphic rocks as a bridge and also some of the uh, alkaline feasible uh, green light as the bridge, just near the uh, green light bodies. And the, Mostly, the zinc can crystallize as large flakes. Later on, we can also see some quartz and zinc big crystals as veins or with irregular uh, lens. And here is the typical photos for the dual core of the pigment of the brachial pipe uh, ores. This picture shows the all minerals association in this deposit, including the only formed columbite with overgrains of columbite, which are tungsten rich columbite, and also with the tantalite, wolframite, cassiterite, and also with the tungsten bearing columbite, and also the hydromite, lagulite, and the chocolate with the cassiterite and also some of the sulfide and the uranium rich tantalite. The zinwadite is the main all minerals of lithium in this deposit, which can crystallize as big flakes or fairly funny crystals together with quartz. And some of them are associated with the topaz and the sulfide minerals such as spherulite. And also we can observe some of the fluoride, which has a closely associated with the zinc diet. And for the old minerals, for example, you can see the monazite, and which associated with the fluoride and also with the zinc uh, diet. Also, the cassiterite occurs in the veins for example, the cassiterite sulfide bearing quartz veins. And in these quartz veins, we can see large crystal of cassiterite. And this cassiterite have fairly well done donations. And they, sometimes they are associated with the spherite and other uh, sulfide minerals. When we have a close look at the cassiterite, we can group it 
into different types. The considered right one is just considered right from the green light. Considered right two is just green uh, considered right from the lights. And the considered right three with the dark color and the light color are those considered right from the quartz veins. You can see the considered right one in particular have very high concentration of niobium and titanium. And also other considered right, they also have high concentration of niobium, titanium, and also the tungsten concentration are also high in the considered right. For the micros, the primary magmatic genodite in the green light proton and the dyes, we call it the micro one. And also we have the micro two, the general diet or the lipid light in the crisper explosive bleachers. And the micro three is just most quiet as veins rains of the metasomatic previous micros, in particular the general diet. And also in the horse rocks, metamorphic rocks, we can see biotype. Here, is the picture for the sulfide minerals, which include the spherite and the chalcopyrite. And also you can see the spherite, they are interacted along the fracture of the genodite. And also this spherite and the galenium, they have a closely association in the veins, for, for example, the quartz sulfide veins. And some of the sulfide, they can replace the considerate as the relics of the considerate in the middle. We distinguish the sulfide as five different types, including those sulfide type one in green light and the sulfide type two in nice, and all those different color sulfide in the veins for the dark color, brown color, and the land color. You can see there is a good trend for the iron and the zinc concentration, which translates to the temperature from the high temperature above 300 degrees to the low temperature in the quartz sulfide veins down to 240 to 260 degrees centigrades. The oxygen and the hydrogen Isotopes also show in this deposit the hydrogen value are normally lower than the physical magmatic fluid, which we interpret as the gas explosion and which cause the, the hydrogen fractionation during the hydrosomal systems. We carry out a detailed uranium lead dating for different minerals, including zirconium, niobium, tantalin, and cassiterite. They all show similar ages, 139 million years. And this age is very fit into the regional mineralization range. And also there's a small peak in the younger 150 million years. In summary, we conclude a mineralization model for the velocity lithium tin polymeric deposit with the intrusive of alkaline phase granite with the gathering of the vanderteil in the top and the roof zone, and then have the krypton explosive Prosive fletcher pipe type lithium uh, mineralization. And away, we have the quartz vein type tin deposit and also some of the lead zinc silver uh, veins away from the greenite body. Now, we move to the hot spring type silicious silicon deposit in C zone. Actually, in C zone, the geosomal field that contains silicious silicon deposit as high as 9,000 ppm back to the early 1980s. 
the silica precipitate from the high temperature geothermal field contained economically valuable rare alkaline metals, including the silicon resource. The formation period are all in the Cenozoic area, which concentrate in the contour period. And most of the hot springs, they occur around the yellow jumbo side zones and also the Bangong Lake Lujian side zones. During the hot spring period, the siliceous season deposit deposit in the silica centers with the upper A and upper C T and upper C. And then when the age continued, they were turned to the quartz. And there is a phase transformation from silicon OH to, to OH silicon with this uh, reactions. And here is the typical example in the Takagi deposit, which occurred around the yellow jumbo side zones. In this deposit, they are located along three different direction fault. And there are five mineralization stage, including the stage one, which is 255 Ka, which is the opposite and the quartz. The stage two is about 100 Ka, which is the opposite and the stage three is 39 Ka for the opposite and all the force and the currently the modern geosomal field with the upper A and upper CT. Here is the outcrop of the target uh, deposit uh, with the currently uh, activity stage five, which some of the 10 to 20 meters higher. Previously, there are many studies working on this deposit, which show the seizure concentration is decreased from the upper A to upper C to upper C and then to Celadon and the quartz. So the enrichment of seizure is associated with the crystallization. And also this diagram show uh, the seizure concentration is related to the water concentration. And for the enrichment mechanism, which includes the cesium OH, the cesium will emplace the H position in the uh, quartz. We recently did a detailed observation of this cesium deposit. We found two types of cesium. The type one, we call it the M1, is the upper A and upper CT. In this type, the concentration of the seizure is quite constant. They have a homogeneous composition. The average is about 0.2%. And then the type M2, we can see a lot of binding. In this binding, there is some kind of clay mineral elite concentration in this binding, which have largely varied season concentration. In the upper, the concentration of the season is similar to the type one, which is around 0.19%. But in the class, in the class, you can see the high concentration of the season, they are associated with the silica and the other potassium minerals, also the aluminum minerals, which come up to 1.4% of the season concentrations. Therefore, in the upper, the cesium may replace the H position in the structures. But most of the are associated with the clays, which we can see in these diagrams. The higher cesium concentration, the higher the aluminum and the calcium concentration. And also the higher cesium concentration, we can see the higher the aluminum concentration. That means most of the should incorporate in the clay mineral structures, which may replace the aluminum position with the cesium, soda, and the potassium. 
we did the modeling and we found it is a dis dissolution uh, precipitation uh, models and the upper A and the inlet precipitation at the pH around seven and the temperature less than 50 degrees centigrade. Also, this modeling shows that at the pH from six to eight, the desolation rate is the lowest one, not only in the e light, but also in the amphibole silicates. That means there is a dissolution with precipitation process going on in this season enrichment process. Then we present a model for the hot spring type silicious season deposit in season with the magma improvement, which may provide the heating flow and also some of the rain meters and uh, along with the footage zone, with the circulation of the meteoritic water and the hot spring vent in the surface with the precipitation of the silicious centers and uh, together with the e-light, which are concentrated the seizure in this e-light and the clay mineral band in the uh, silicates. Now we come to the conclusions. Uh, in this talk, we just briefly introduce some of the geological characteristics of rare metal deposit in China. Then we emphasize three new types of rare metal deposit we currently working on in China, including the Nibitolite type rare metal deposit in Yusan and the Hydrosomal Grapeton Explosive Bleacher Pipe type in the Velasto and also the Hot Spring type silicious season deposit in Xizhang. Many thanks. That's all for my talks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Yang. It's really valuable and it was very comprehensive. So now we can move on to the question and answer session. And so I'm going to read the questions that are here. Uh, we have the first one from Jules Noran. Uh, what is the source of Isleweil in the advanced Red earth type. Uh, in which type you? Uh, you can see the question in in the Q and A section, the yeah. little box at the bottom is the first one. What is the uh, source of albite? Albite. The, the albite you, you, in which deposit I. Uh, Oh, it's. Is there also to the pit type in the type? Oh, okay. Uh, the arbit mostly. Uh, uh, for example, for the uh, for the uh greenite type deposit in the highly fractionated greenite type. And the arbite we think it is the highly fractionated uh, greenite. Uh, but we also figure out some of the arbite, maybe the soda metasomatism in the very later stage of the magmatic uh, stage, which have when the um, greenite fractionated in the highly fractionated greenite, then in the transition between the magmatic to hydrosomal uh, stage. Thank you so much. Um, the same person also formulated the following question. It says, in these systems, which are associated to the pegmatite is the type of granite important? S or I type? And do the source rock play any role in the mineralization and type of metal enrichment? Uh, yes, in most of the greenite type deposit, rare metal deposit, the Actually, the pigmentite type is not that important. For example, in the super large Yichun rare metal deposit in Jiangxi province of South China, 
the main oil body is the highly fractionated granite. There are some pigmentite in the roof zone of this granite, but the amount of pigmentite is not that much important. And the granite, we think it is an ace type granite for this oil bearing albite lipidolite granite in eastern deposit. Uh, yes, I think it is very important for the fossil rocks, for the source rocks. Normally for the rare metal mineralization, there are two important factors. The first one is the source rocks. The second one is the highly fractionated nature. But only the enrichment of rare metal, the initial enrichment of rare metal in the source rocks is not enough to produce the, the large and super large greenery type rare metal deposit. For example, those in the eastern deposit in South China. However, for the second type, we call it the lipid-like type rare metal deposit. The source rock is very important because during the alkali volcanic rock eruption, these volcanic rocks contain the initial enrichment of titanium, niobium, and rares, but the grade, the old grade is very low. They cannot produce the economically important rare metal deposit. Only after the later stage, during the later stage metamorphism and the hydrosomal overprinting during the cell zone development, there is a immobilization of the Leobin, Tantalin, and the rares from the primary volcanic rocks into the small veins, we can see all these rare metal, they are associated with the magnetite. So the higher the magnetite concentration, the higher the, the rate the ores in this lipid deposit. Therefore, I think the source control and the process control are both important for this deposit. But in different deposits, the contribution percentage is different from the source and from the process control. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, now, now I'm gonna move into the next questions. We have plenty of time, so I'm gonna go through all of them. Uh, Matthew Rhodes asks, are there no sediment hosted earth in China, deep pelagic sediments or ionic clays? Uh, yes. The most important rare deposit in China, as we all know, is in the Bayun Obo. That is the carbonatite type deposit. And we also have some of the rare as a byproduct for those alkaline greenite type deposit, and also in some of the pigmentite deposit. Yes, uh, in recent years, we found some of the sedimentary host rare earth deposit in South China. They are associated with the uh, uh, clay stones. And uh, nowadays, they are just uh, under exploration. And uh, we think this type of the sedimental host rare earth deposit should be very important in the future. And uh, also in South China, in, we have a lot of uh, phosphorite deposit. In some of these phosphorite deposit, we also can have high concentration of rares, in particular, some of the phosphorite deposit can contain a very high concentration of high world rares. But nowadays, it is a lot use, uh, useful because uh, it's difficult to uh, extract the uh, rares from this phosphorite uh, economically. Thank you so much. Now, Richard asks, is the cesium actually being recovered in China from the hot spring deposits, or is it presently just a geochemical anomaly? Uh, yes, in only in two or three uh, deposits in, in Tibet, in Xizhang, in, in, in we're recovering the lithium together with some other rare metals, for example, the lithium and other minerals uh, and the boron together. But most of them, they are 
actually the geochemical anomalies in the uh, hot spring bed, not only in Tibet, but also in Yunnan province. We have a long hot spring bed in the west of China. And mostly they have the geochemical anomaly, not only lesion, but also cesium, uh, lesion, rubidin, strontine, and boron. Uh, and are those uh, and like is there any recovery in those places? Uh, yes, there are some recovery of of, of the cesium together with the lesion in only okay. in two or three places. Okay, thank you so much. Nancy asks. Can you hypothesize possibility of cesium deposit in the geothermal regions of East Africa Rift system? There are known opal deposits in these regions, in example, in Ethiopia Rift. Uh, yes, uh, I think maybe previously people didn't uh, look at the cesium concentration in this kind of uh, hot spring systems. Uh, if the geological setting and the geological characteristics is similar to the Tibet and the uh, West China. I think there is a high chance to find this rainwater mineralization in this hot spring uh, deposit. For example, the upper deposit in these different uh, regions in the world. It Thank is you. possible, I think. Uh, Sarah says, Hello, my question is about the leptinite, leucognize type rare metal deposits. Do these deposits only form in nisic metamorphic complexes? Will they also form in metamorphic conditions that involve lower temperatures and pressures? Green, green keys uh, conditions, for example? Uh, not really. At the moment, we only find uh, those kind of uh, mineralization in the higher metamorphic grade. In the lower temperature and the low pressure green system bed, we have a lot of this kind of bed in China, but we did not find any mineralization of niobium uh, and tantalum. Actually, we also found in this bed the high rare earth rich mineralization in the lights and the the neobin tantalum concentration is lower, but the rare earth concentration, especially the high rare earth concentration is higher in the some of the lights, but not in, in West China, but in East China, for example, in the lowest part of Hubei province, we are currently working on this kind of the rare earth, high rare earth enrichment in these lights. Thank you so much. We have one more question here. It's from David. It says, first of all, thank you for this detailed description of rare metal deposits that are not well documented in Western literature. Um, your talk definitely opens up my thinking to other settings. Great talk. Well, that was just a congratulation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> and I think a lot of people is liking that, so everyone agrees. <laughs> but we have one more question. Um, are there any examples of rare earths in I-type uh, metamorphic core complex? Uh, not really. We, we found some I-type green light, which have some of the rare earth mineralization uh, in the Yangtze metamorphic uh, mineralization bed. And they bought the uh, rare earth enrichment is not that, uh, that great. So they have low economic values at the moment. Okay, so that's everything that we have from the public today. Professor Yan, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and we hopefully will have you in future work with SEG. Uh, it was a pleasure to host you today. So now I'm gonna move on and I'd like to go to our next presentation and I, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, our next lecturer. Um, this is Sally Goodman Newman, and she is the SEG Tyre Linsley Visiting Lecturer. And I'm gonna go through uh, the Sally Goodman 
successful career in a nutshell. Sally Goodman is the Vice President of Generative Exploration for Newman, spearheading the drive to discovery across the company's global portfolio on early stage exploration projects. Before joining Newman, she was Chief Geoscientist with Atlantic Gold, following five years with Gold Corp in a variety of corporate technical positions. Prior to that, she traveled globally as a consultant in structural geology with SRK Consulting. After holding various lecturing and research posts in university in Canada and the UK, she has a PhD degree in economic geology and an MS degree in mineral exploration from the Royal School of Mine in London, UK, and a BS degree in geological science from Leeds University in the UK as well. Newman is the world leading gold company and a producer of copper, sorry, silver, zinc, and lead. Newman was founded in 1921 and has been publicly traded since 1925. With a head office in Denver, Colorado, the company has a world class portfolio of assets in North America, South America, Australia, and Africa. What a career! So now uh, this is what we are going to cover today, the mineral systems approach to exploration. Are we capitalizing on its promise and avoiding its pitfalls? And now I turn to Sally. Thank you for the introduction, Valeria. And um, let me... Mm. Okay, that's not going to... You're very welcome. Please let me know if, if everything is okay on your end. Yeah, I'm just trying to share my screen. Uh... All right, there it is. If you could let me know whether you can see the presentation. Yes, it's right there, and now it's in presenting mode. In presenting. It is in presenting mode, okay. Yep. So um, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the SEG to, for giving me the, the opportunity to present. And also thanks to, to those of you who are listening online, um, and also to, to everyone who's, whose work I have um, borrowed for this presentation. Uh, this is the, the standard forward-looking statement, so um, don't believe everything that I say. Um, so mineral systems. What I'm going to cover in, in this presentation is starting off, what exactly do we mean by a mineral system? What is a mineral systems approach in exploration? And how is it different to using mineral deposit models? Are we using mineral systems fully in our exploration process? Um, and if not, what can we do differently to improve our chances of success? So starting at the beginning, what exactly do we mean by a mineral system? It's a concept that's been around for quite a while. Um, the left-hand side there, there's a, a definition from 30 years ago. Um, and I'm not going to read through these, these definitions. These are just three that I, I picked out of, out of many examples. What all these definitions do is they emphasize geological process. So geological factors that control the generation and preservation of mineral deposits or a framework for predictive understanding of processes. So it's all about that holistic view. It's all about the process um, of creating a mineral deposit. Um, where does it come from, the concept? Well, you know, we all know about petroleum systems, which are uh, very much simpler um, conceptually than, than our, our mineral systems. At the left-hand side there, we've got the standard um, Geology 101 figure of a petroleum system, where we start off with um, hydrocarbon generation in an organic rich shale. Um, the hydrocarbons that are generated as that shale is cooked migrate up a migration pathway and they're, they're trapped in some sort of um, physical trap underneath a barrier 
where the, the hydrocarbons can accumulate close enough to the surface that we can tap into them. And there are obviously variations in that model, but it's a model that has served the petroleum industry pretty well um, in terms of, of identifying exploration targets. If we then turn to the right hand side, and this is a, um, a mineral system diagram for orogenic gold deposits. And without even going through the different aspects that are on that diagram, you can already see that it's more complex than the petroleum system diagram. And you also have to remember that this is a mineral system for one commodity, gold, and for one type of deposit, the orogenic gold deposit type. So in terms of the overall systems, our, our mineral deposits are inherently more complex and more varied than the hydrocarbon petroleum exploration system. So what's the difference between a mineral system and a deposit model? We all know the standard deposit models. We all learn about them early in our geological career. So what is the difference between these two different approaches? The main difference is that taking a mineral systems approach, it's all about the process and is to a certain extent agnostic of the product, of the end point. Um, at the left hand side there, this is a, a diagram from, from Graham Bake that um, is an attempt to, to show a mineral system for gold deposits. So there's something happening down in the mantle, there's a transport path. And at the top there, there's the gold deposits family. So orogenic gold, intrusive related gold, epithermal gold, porphyry, copper gold, IOCG deposits. So that this whole system with a variety of products at the end point. Our gold deposit models are shown at the right hand side. And you know, this sort of diagram is very familiar. Um, if we think purely in terms of a deposit model, they can be, it can be quite a reductive way of thinking. We're confining ourselves to specific characteristics that we relate to a particular type of deposit. Now, it's a very useful um, concept. It's a very useful shorthand because if someone talks about epithermal deposits, for example, we immediately have um, a mental picture of what they're talking about. It's also quite useful being in, the, in industry it's quite a useful terminology when we're talking to investors or analysts because they understand something about what an orogenic deposit is versus a, an epithermal deposit versus a porphyry deposit. So these deposit models are very important to us. But um, as we know, mineral deposits are not isolated in real life in the way that they are in that diagram. Um, and I just pulled this from the, the introductory chapter to the SEG volume on, on gold deposit types. And in that introduction, there are, I think there's 11 different types of deposit there. And then there are other deposit types at the end. And this wonderful statement, which I'm going to read because it's, it's, it's so what our industry is all about really. Some of the gold deposit types characterized herein can occur in close association either with gold poor examples of the same deposit types or with other gold deposit types. And alternatively, transitional formational environments can enable formation of hybrid deposits. In other words, we're dealing with a continuum of deposits, which we know um, all of those deposit types can be related. All of those deposit types in the, in the diagram, maybe paleoplasts are kind of their own deal, but, but we know that by and large, we're dealing with a continuum. And in fact, in exploration, we do ourselves a bit of a disservice if we decide a priori what we're going to find. Because we know that 99 times out of 100, the deposit that we discover is not going to have all those standard characteristics of our deposit model. So to me, the power of thinking about a mineral system is that we're thinking about the process and then finding out at the end of it, what deposits may be associated with that mineral system, rather than being too constrained upfront about our deposit type, our deposit model that we're hoping to find. 
during this talk, I'm, I'm going to use largely examples from gold exploration because that's that's the business that I work in. But uh, most of what I say is applicable um, in in many different commodities, many different situations. So I'm just starting here with the um, a map of where Newmont co currently operates. Um, we've got in, in blue operating mines and then some of the, the active exploration projects in, in that sort of gold color. Um, and outlined in red, three mines in the Americas, Eleonore in, in Quebec in Canada, Penasquito in, in Mexico and Cerro Negro in Argentina. Very different types of deposit. Um, I'm going to use them as examples as I go through this talk because hopefully that will help emphasize some of the commonalities that um, we're drawing on if we think in terms of a mineral system, which we perhaps might not see if we were too prescriptive in, in, in just looking at the, the, the type of deposit. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've been in meetings all day, I'm getting a bit dry. <clears throat> All right, so just a little bit of introduction to those, those three deposits, all of which are, are currently operating mines. Eleanor is an orogenic gold deposit. It's hosted in, in Archean age, amphibolite fasces, metasedimentary rocks, um, steeply dipping ore bodies, at least three phases of, of folding, very complex ore zone, uh, mainly gold. Cerro Negro, in Argentina is in the Deseado Massif. It's hosted in, in Jurassic uh, volcanic sequence. Um, it's a low sulfidation epithermal gold deposits with a, a significant amount of silver associated. And then the, the third deposit I'm going to use as an example is Penasquito in Mexico, which is a very big open pit mine. There are two breccia pipes which are mineralized and have mineralization in the host rocks surrounding the pipes. Um, they fire off uh, an underlying, um, very large intrusive center. And these are the, the host rocks are um, folded Cretaceous and, and Jurassic and Cretaceous sediments. Um, the age of the mineralization, the age of the intrusions, they're, they're Mesozoic age intrusions. So, um, if we think about the, the mineral system, and I'm sure everybody's seen some version of this diagram before, we need a combination of key features to produce an economic ore deposit. That's the whole thesis of, of taking this mineral systems approach. So here we've got um, in that central Venn diagram, mantle fertility, proximity to lithosphere, lithospheric scale structures, and favorable geodynamic setting and if all of those work together you have that bullseye in the middle and you get an ore deposit and just listed in in some of those circles are, are some of the tools that we might use to define whether we have those uh, those features in place off to the right hand side we have preservation um, because we al also need to have our ore deposit um, close enough to the surface that we can mine it but not not exhumed to the extent where um, it's been eroded away. So if we start by looking at fertility, what does that mean? Fertility of the source area. Um, it really means processes that start in the mantle. Um, now there may be a staging area within the crust, in the upper part of the lithosphere, but really we're talking about um, mantle processes that define what metals are um, liberated, what type of fluids are transporting those metals, whether they're hydrothermal fluids, what type of melts, um, what type of magmas are generated and encapsulate those, those metals and help to transport them to the surface. So mantle processes are key in determining the fertility of the mantle, what metals are going to be um, available to be transported into the, um, the upper crust for us to mine, ultimately. And we can see this today where we have our active subduction zones. This is the Andes, um, the, the surface there 
is that a plan view at the left hand side and then a, a sort of 3D image at the right hand side of the subducting slab from seismic tomography. Um, so we can see in blue areas where that, that slab is flat and, and in red, orange and red, areas where the slab is steeper. And there's a, an obvious relationship between the, um, the geometry of that subducting slab and metal deposits. And that is related to those processes that are, are going on in the mantle wedge as the slab is being subducted. And I'm sorry, I haven't got any labels on these, but you know, some of this is proprietary data, so it was easier just to, to leave the labels off, but I'm, I'm sure you, you can uh, make up your own minds what those uh, various colored circles and balls represent. <clears throat> it's important to, to also think that this is not just a, a one and done, you know, zap all the, the metals um, out of the mantle and, and up into the upper crust. Our, our whole earth system is very dynamic. Um, different processes have, have happened along subduction zones at different times. We know along the, the, the Andean margin, there's a long history of accretion, different mantle processes, different um, geochemical um, activity, different ma uh, magma types and different metals being generated um, due to those subduction processes. So we can expect to see not only um, segmentation along the, uh, the margin of, of the, the continent as, as the, there's a different geometry, current geometry of the slab, but also going back through time, um, that these different periods of, of accretion, these different um, types, styles of subduction are going to generate uh, different types, ultimately, of mineral deposits. If we look at, at Cerro Negro, um, this is the, the Deseado Massif, and here we have two phases of activity. Um, the first at about 180 million years, where there's, there's a plume impacting the base of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, um, enriching that mantle in, in metals, which are then liberated at a later time as subduction gets going, and, and partial melting of that mantle wedge transports, um, causes the, um, the volcanism, transports the metals to the surface and, and results in the epithermal gold deposits of Sarah Negra. Now going back in time, you know, we, we know the Archean was very different. We know we had higher heat flow. Um, we think there was some version of plate tectonics, um, but there certainly were not you know, big continental masses. The turnover was probably a lot more rapid, but we can still see segmentation. This is the Ilgon Craton in, in Australia. We can see, still see segmentation. We can still see differences in magmatic compositions, and we see differences in the metal budget. And again, these are related to mantle processes um, in different areas as there were different different processes, different geometries, even if it's not subduction as we, we understand it at, at present, we can still call on um, different areas of the mantle being fertile to different degrees, generating different metals, generating different, um, different metals. Um, and if you turn this 90 degrees, the superior province in Canada is, is very similar. There are certain areas which are much more well endowed in metals um, because of the processes that went on in the underlying mantle. So, excuse me, we start off generating our goodies in the mantle. We have to somehow get them into ultimately the, the upper part of the, the lithosphere where we can mine them. And to do that, we need to have proximity to these through-going translithospheric structures. Translithospheric faults. Um, here we've got a kind of grain bag cartoon at the left-hand side with like, convecting upper mantle, generating these melts, 
generating metals, um, metal rich magmas, transporting them up that um, steep conduit to the surface. So very large scale structures going right the way through the lithosphere if they're going to, to tap um, the upper mantle. Now we've known about these for a long time. This is a very wonderful book. It was published in 1948, Structural Geology of Canadian Ore Deposits. And I'm sorry it's all fuzzy in the middle. I had to put this on the scanner and I didn't want to, to break the back of the book. Um, there are two big structures there. I wonder if I can get my pointer, pointer options. Okay, here we go. So hopefully um, this is visible. The northern structure here, which is the Duster Porcupine Fault, which comes to running down through here, and then the Cadillac Larder Lake break. So this is the Val d'Or area in, in the Abitibi. So even in 1948, which was long before plate tectonics became an accepted theory, the importance of these big through-going structures was, was recognized. Um, the reason why they were so important in, in localizing ore deposits was not as clear as it perhaps is now, but it was, it was still, we still knew that they were very important. And that's just an, an overlay from a, a paper in, in 2020. And again, we can see the, the Ladalike, uh, Larder Lake Cadillac fault zone and the Desta Porcupine fault zone. And, and you know, they're, they're still there in our interpretations. We, we know that these are fundamental structures and, and that they're very deep tapping and very important in terms of localizing the gold deposits. So how can we find these things? Um, if we have um, regional scale geophysics that, that sees deep, then we can identify them in those data sets in certain cases. This is, this is actually regional aeromagnetic data, but it's been processed to remove all of the high frequency noise, the stuff that we're normally interested in because we want to interpret near surface um, geology. This is the long wavelength um, features um, which show us where those bigger, deeper structures are. So we can use this, this type of data to make an interpretation of, of where our fundamental lithospheric -lith structures may be. Sometimes we can also see them in the field. So here, this is at the western end of, of the Tethian belt. There's a, a very deep linear valley, um, big topographic feature. Um, the lower photo there, these, these dark rocks here, these are slices of ophiolite that are, are slapped against the end, edge of the fault zone at the right-hand side. The, the rocks in this area, there's a huge amount of alteration. Um, juxtaposition of rocks of various different ages across the fault, against the fault zone, um, and a huge amount of fluid has clearly been pumped through a large volume of crust and you go, okay, this looks like a big fundamental plumbing system. Those are the ones that are easy to see. <clears throat> Not always that easy. So here we are back at, at Penisquito diagram that I showed before. And there are lots of, of deposits. Penisquito is, is here. Um, there are many other um, large deposits in, in the area. Um, and there's also a number of linear features. The, the browns and, uh, sorry, greens and blues in, in that map at the right-hand side, those are the Cretaceous and Jurassic um, folded sequence of the, um, yeah, the fold belt. The beige colors are tertiary sands and gravels that fill in um, the valleys. And you, know, you can see that some of these valleys are, are very linear. There's a valley that runs up just to the west of Penisquito, and you can trace it way up through here. And in fact, you can trace it half the way across um, Mexico up to the north. And that's what's known as the Santa Bercio lineament. And it's been because a lot of the mineralization is very close to that lineament and on in the eastern side. It's, it's been identified as a major um, fundamental structure which is controlling the mineralization in some way. Um, so here we're zooming in a bit um, on the, the map underneath, the Santa Bercio lineament is, is dashed in here. Um, but as we get closer and closer, it begins to disappear, right? So here's the lineament. However, 
If you look at these arcuate ranges in the bedrock, you can trace them right the way across the valley where that lineament supposedly goes. And so this is, again, the same image, just zoomed in a bit more. These big arcuate folds go right across that lineament without being offset. Um, and this is something that, that we have to be very careful about when we're trying to identify these big basement structures that you know, in, in that case from the Tethian, it was pretty obvious where that fault was, but that's not always the case. They can be very cryptic in surface geology. They're still there in the basement, but younger stratigraphy has, has overridden them so that at our current land surface, we, we, we don't see them as major offsets in the, the outcropping geology. Now, at Penusquito, if you take a step back, um, the, that San Tiburcio lineament, which is this white dashed line here, it is a fundamental break between basement terrains. And you can see certain um, differences in the surface geology between the different terrains. Um, there are Triassic schists to the west of that line, which don't occur to the east. Um, there are different, in, different chemistries in the, in the magmatic rocks, both volcanics and, and intrusives. So if you take a step back and look at it on that sort of scale, yes, for sure, it is one of these deep, um, fundamental translithospheric faults, but it has been overridden by the surface geology so that at the surface it is very cryptic. <clears throat> Um, in the Archean Superior Province, it's at the contact between the Lagrande and Upanaka subdomains of the Superior Province. And there have been um, a lot of discussions at various times about whether Eleanor is in the Lagrande domain or whether it is in, in, in the Upanaka domain. The contact between the two subdomains, there are, there are gold deposits scattered um, around many places around that contact. So Eleanor is, is here. If we zoom in a bit, um, the, the Eleanor area is, has a different uh, magnetic character from the area to the north and to the south. And in fact, on the map here, all of these blue, all this blue area are metasediments. Right? So compared to migmatitic rocks to the, the northeast and a series of mafic rocks to the southwest. So the discussion about whether Eleanor is in the Opanaka subdomain or in the Lagrange subdomain is sort of moot. The contact between those subdomains is in the basement beneath Eleanor. Eleanor sits in this very distinct sedimentary basin that at a certain time opened up along that subdomain boundary and has subsequently you know, seen multiple phases of deformation and mineralization. So again, at Eleanor, we can't put our finger, finger on that subdomain boundary. We can't put our finger on that fundamental structure that is feeding fluids and magmas into, into the, or fluids in this case, into the, the deposit area um, because Eleanor sits in a sedimentary basin that is right on top of that fault. Um, now, of course, those fundamental translithospheric structures, they feed the, the metals, either in, in fluids or in magmas, up into, into the lithosphere, um, where it's commonly in, in second order structures that we, we see our deposits developed. Um, so this is a, a map view of, of Eleanor. Um, there are two sedimentary sequences. The one in the east is more calcareous. Then there's, there's a, a very distinct contact with rocks in the west, which are more Semitic. And the mineralized horizons, um, they're silicious units with a lot of tourmaline rather than being well-developed veins. Um, but they are parallel to that contact and stepping across um, the stratigraphy. 
And there are also mineralized structures that cut that at a high angle. If you look at Eleanor now, if you look at the block diagram at the right hand side there, it has a very complex geometry. But if you unfold it, conceptually unfold it, and think about it in terms of being a sedimentary basin originally, um, it really helps unravel the geometry and understand the original geometry of, of the ore zones. So here I've just rotated that diagram on the right. Um, and we've got one anticline that's parallel to that, that thrust. And then the whole sequence has been refolded. On the left-hand side, I've got um, an interpretation of seismic data from the Mizzen Basin off Ireland. This is a petroleum basin, um, a sedimentary basin that's seen um, inversion, basin inversion, with um, folding against these thrusts with anticline in the hanging wall of the thrust um, and cross structures at a high angle to that. This is what Eleanor was like. There is a phase of folding at Eleanor prior to the mineralization. So there was basin development, basin inversion, and then the mineralization at Eleanor came in during the second phase of deformation when you started to get that lateral compression. So understanding the early architecture is really key to knowing where those fluids went um, during mineralization. So they come up the big structure, the translithospheric structure, and then escape into second order structures at a higher level. So structural inheritance, I'm not saying anything new here, but it's understanding the original architecture of the system is really key in, in knowing where those second order structures are likely to be. Um, this is, is getting back to our, our um, porcupine area. Um, and very often where the big structures are, uh, we have these conglomeratic units. And not that there's anything special about the conglomerates in, in general, but they're just identifying, in this case, it's the Tamiskaming, identifying where the, the major structures are that allow us to start to, to pick the architecture apart. <clears throat> At Penyuskido, mineralization took place well after um, the folding event, but it still utilizes the full thrust architecture. Um, we see thrust faults with, um, with intrusives along them. We see mineralization along fracture patterns, which were set up at the, the time of folding. So again, it, it's key to understand the, the architecture that the magmas and the fluids were coming into. Which leads us on to the, the third aspect. So, you know, we started with our, our fertile mantles. We've got our fluids up, uh, our fluids and magmas up a lithospheric scale structures. And, and how do we do that? Um, and this third part is this, this transient geodynamics. There's some trigger that pumps a material up those, those structures and out into the, um, into the, the waiting um, sequence. And it, it's a very active, it's a very active system. We need, we need movement. Um, we don't just have structures that are sitting around there, you know, waiting to be passively mineralized. There is some, some change in the geodynamics, which is a pump that, that pulls the, the fluids into the, into the, the crust, into the, the areas where we're now uh, mining them. This is an event chart, a time space chart for, for Penusquito. Um, long history, short period of mineralization. And it's really in this case at the point where subduction ceases, but before extension really gets, gets going. So it's at that point where um, compression relaxes, when the fluids are, are able to, to uh, flow into, into the rocks. The way I like to think about this is that if you have a, if you have a champagne bottle and you've shaken it up enough, you don't need to pull the cork out. All you need to do is slightly release the pressure of your thumb on the cork and it'll blow by itself. 
So mineralization, these major episodes of mineralization commonly follow a change in the stress regime. And this is, this is our geodynamic pump. Um, in the figure here, we've got um, deformation related to, to subduction. And then once we, we start to, to subduct that transfer fault, it changes the, um, the kinematics of the zone. And it's that time when the gold deposits are formed. At Penisquito, as I say, it's relaxation of compression. At Eleanor, we go from that, that period of inversion and when um, more or less orthogonal compression starts, that's at the time that the, um, the mineralization takes place. At Cerro Negro, we go from an extensional regime to transtension, and it's during that transtensional time that the epithermal veins are formed. <clears throat> Timing is everything. Porphyry systems commonly occur when there's a relaxation of that compressive stress. Now, timing isn't the only thing, um, and the you know we know that the the setting of of our magmas, of our fluids in the crust is also key in determining whether we're going to have an economic ore body or not, and also the style of deposit. So here, I think I'm I'm. I don't want to run over time, so I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. But you know, we've got the same the same mineral system here. Ultimately, the different processes in, in the crust leading to different styles of gold mineralization, whether they're epithermal, IOCG, um, <clears throat> you know, orogenic, or in, intrusion related. Um, so you know those crustal processes are are a very important part of 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 the system and understanding the geodynamic setting is going to tell us um, what, what the setting is going to be. Here at Cerro Negro, we went from this, this a change from you know, pure, pure extension to, to transtension. Um, beautiful epithermal vein systems um, look very like the, the Im image on the left. Um, as we know that the, the geometry of, of vein systems that sit in, in faults are controlled by the kinematics of the faults. So if we have um, normal faults or reverse faults, um, then we get low plunge on our ore zones and strike slip faults. We get, we get steep, sorry, we, we get flat ore zones. If we have strike slip faults, we get steeply plunging ore zones. At Cerro Negro, we can see um, we have east-west and northwest-southeast faults with the epithermal vein sitting in them. And the kinematics of those faults at the time of vein formation control the plunge of the ore zones. And there's a very distinct relationship between the, 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 the plunge and where our veins sit in that, um, that fault network. And again, at Cerro Negro, mineralization is restricted to a very short time frame. Um, there are multiple phases of vein formation, but the gold was pumping through the system in a very short period at that, that trigger point um, when the trans, um, tensional event was taking place. Also at Cerro Negro, um, there is post or block faulting, which controls the exposure level that we see in the veins, and also in some cases the cover sequence. So there are parts of the, the vein field where the veins crop out as, as big walls going across the, the countryside. There are other places where we can trace the same structures, but they, they extend under cover because of the post mineral um, block faulting and either volcanic or um, sedimentary cover sequence that now cover the veins, which is our, <clears throat> our final element of the mineral system, the preservation piece. So we have fertility, we can generate our, um, our fluids, our magmas, which are metal rich. We pump them up our lithospheric scale structures, which are, can tap our deep source and, and bring our metals close to the surface. And what triggers that is this favorable dynamic event, um, which also will um, control where in, in 
are other crustal architecture, the deposits are going to sit. <clears throat> and then we have to preserve them somewhere where we can mine them. So, you know, as, as a final example, um, you know, here at, at, at Penasquito, again, we've got post mineral extension, basin and range type extension. <clears throat> Some of the, the basins that are, are, have tertiary sand and gravel are quite shallow and we can still explore and, and hope to mine the, the bedrock under those areas. In some cases, we've got kilometers of detritus, basically, in these basins, and it's far too deep for us to, to do reasonable exploration. So again, something, something to think about when we're um, developing our exploration plans. So just to come back to um, using the mineral system in exploration, we can have the same elements, the same um, features within the mineral system, um, giving us very different deposit types. And I think this is, this is key, that if we're taking a mineral systems approach, we don't really know what the end point is. Um, and I've had conversations with people where they tell me, oh, we've, we've been using a mineral systems approach for a long time. Go well, you haven't really, because you're looking at this area and you're saying, I'm going to look in this area for this type of deposit, rather than taking a step back and saying, what is the mineral system that we have here? And what are the potential deposit types that might be generated? Maybe they're not commodities I'm interested in. Maybe they're not deposit types I was expecting. But that to me is how we should be using this mineral system idea um, to make our exploration plans. If we just take a step back for a minute and, and look at the, the petroleum system and the mineral system, the one thing we haven't really touched on is the trap. We've talked about you know, structures that our, our fluids, our magmas can, can get out into. Um, we do also have this variable, which is trap sites. And this image would just be for gold deposits, um, just for orogenic gold deposits. Um, we know we've got physical traps like dilatant zones, like fault splays, like anticlinal hinges. We have chemical traps, reactive and permeable stratigraphy, mafic volcanic units, sulfidic units, magnetite bearing sandstones, all sorts of stuff. This is um, an example which has in the one deposit multiple trap sites. So all of these different variables can come into play to determine ultimately what our deposit is going to look like. So to me, the pitfall that we've tended to, to fall into is trying to tie the process model, our mineral system model, to our mineral deposit type our mineral deposit model that we're very comfortable with. Um, I think we really, to make the most of, of thinking in a mineral systems way, we need to be thinking about the process and not worrying about the product. So when I see this type of diagram, which is a mineral system for orogenic gold, yes, it is, but it doesn't really tap the power that sits behind taking a mineral systems approach to our exploration um, areas. <clears throat> so what is exactly does that mean? You know, it's all very well to say we need to take a process model approach for mineral exploration, but how are we going to do that? We need to think about the process that leads to deposits. And you know, an economic deposit is a very unusual ac accumulation of a commodity that we're interested in, but the processes themselves are not unusual. Um, all of our mineral deposits form through well-known geological processes. We understand the processes and we have numerical models for some of them. To me, the limit of using mineral deposits models is that it's backward looking. We're looking for characteristics 
of a deposit type, even though we know that the next deposit will always be subtly different from whatever we've already got. And this is a particular challenge in areas under cover or frontier exploration areas where we have to get smarter if we're going to find the next generation of mineral deposits. Now, mineral systems sort of free us from, from that thinking, um, but only if we really buy into the method, if we really buy into building process models, which are forward looking and more predictive and maybe let go of our loved and tried and true deposit models that we've, we've relied on um, for a long time. And I think there's an opportunity now while we're changing uh, as an industry, perhaps, what we're looking for. You know, there's a new impetus to look for new commodities in different areas. Um, maybe this is the opportunity we need to do things differently. And I think this is my challenge to a new generation. You know, I'm too long in the tooth to do this, okay? But um, it's my challenge to, to the new generation. How can we build more effective exploration models using this process approach, using this forward-looking predictive mineral systems approach? Um, now that's all very well to say, but like conceptually, what is a process model? And that little Venn diagram at the bottom there, even though it encapsulates what we think we need in our mineral system to give us an ore deposit is not really very helpful in terms of conceptualizing what a process model is. So the best thing that I've come up with as an analogy is this. This is my process model. So at the base, that root zone, these are our mantle processes. Like we can tap different parts of the mantle at different times where there are different processes which are generating different metal budgets, different magma types, different fluids. So we start off with those different potential starting points. We then have our translithospheric structure, that's the trunk, we're funneling all that material up into the upper crust where there are different ge geodynamic episodes, which are our limbs. So those are our time episodes. And then at the top, we have multiple possible outcomes. And I've only got one economic ore deposit there. I've got a golden apple, but you know, there may be others. There may be in that same area, within that same system, undoubtedly different deposit types, maybe different commodity types that have been generated within that geographical system over different times. And I think this is how we have to start thinking in exploration if we're going to make that step change and start using a systems approach and process models rather than continuing to try and build our exploration models backwards from what we think we know and detecting deposits. So for me, to be predictive, we have to think about things in this way. Now, yes, our, our Earth system is, is very complex and there are lots of interdependencies. And to think, you know, if we're ever going to be able to build this, these process models as like numerical models would be a huge challenge, right? And it's certainly, not something which we can just decide we're going to do in a couple of months and, and have, a, have a model that, that works, that really serves its purpose. But maybe we have something to learn from our, our colleagues in climate science, because they have built process models. They built process models on a global scale of a very complex Earth system where there are many, many interdependencies. And we believe in their predictive models because governments are making 
all sorts of decisions on our behalf based on these models. So if the climate scientists can do it, why should we not be able to do it? Maybe not now, but maybe not in maybe in the future. You know, maybe we can also build our process models that will give us many possible outcomes. And some of those outcomes will identify our economic order deposits. And I'll just finish by saying we actually have an advantage over the climate scientists because they're building predictive models that predict the future and are inherently untestable until we get there. Whereas we would be building process models that start in the past and they predict the present. And we have a way of testing them. So again, I'm throwing that out to the next generation as a challenge. And I, I really believe whether we do it numerically or whether we simply conceptualize these process models, to me, that is the strength of using um, the mineral systems approach to exploration. And that to me is where we really need to be. And I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you so much, Sally, for this presentation. It was awesome. Now we can move on to some of the public um, questions. Uh, I'm going to go in order, if that's OK with you. And uh, the first one is from Lyon. Harris, I'm sorry if I'm not saying it right. Um, how do you reconcile the deep north-south transverse structures continuing beneath sub-provinces portrayed by the long wavelength aeromagnetic image for the superior with your comment that there is still a form of plate tectonics in the arcane? Okay, Lyle, um, good to see you virtually. Um, I, okay, that, that I, I guess I played fast and loose with the term plate tectonics. There's certainly some form of um, mantle processes. We know that. Um, I know there's, there's a debate about whether we're seeing um, plumes in the deep data and at what stage anything resembling modern plate tectonics gets going. I, I think my, my, you know, my point is that even back in the Archean, we, we see that segmentation of our, our provinces. We see different styles of intrusive rocks. We see different chemistries and we see areas which have a much higher metal budget of whatever type than, than other regions. So even, you know, it, it's easy to say, to talk about mantle processes in a modern subduction zone because we can, um, there's much better control on that. But, you know, I, I think those processes, whatever they were, they were still segmenting and differentiating the mantle um, back as far as we have a rock record. Thank you so much. Uh, now we have a question from Jules. It says, apart from trapping or ore, do traps play any other role such as enrichment of deposits? I'm sorry, can you? Uh, yeah, is the is apart from trapping or ore, do traps play any other role, such as enrichment of deposits? Sure. Um, anywhere that we have have potential for for trapping fluid, we could we could get upgrading through through enrichment. Um, we have to be a bit careful here um, in terms of what exactly we're talking about. You know, what does exactly does enrichment mean. I had a very interesting discussion when I gave, gave this talk at a, at a conference and someone came came up to me at the end and, and basically told me that you know, the deposit that they were working on, it was no use looking at the mineral systems approach because it just didn't work. Um, and then after we discussed things a bit more, what they're actually working on is, is a supergene deposit. You go, well, that and I hadn't thought about this before, but you know, the supergene 
piece of the puzzle really fits down at the right hand side in that surface processes and um, preservation piece rather than in what was the the original um, mineral system for for the primary mineralization okay and um I'm not sure if Sarah uh, still wants to make this question, but I'm gonna ask just in case there are some points for clarification. Uh, it says, can you please talk about the mineral system equivalent of the petroleum system concept of traps? For instance, do you see reactively tollage like black shales, uh, mafic, inframite, mafic, et cetera, as having an import, important role in the process of deposit formation? It's kind of on the same, yeah, um, absolutely, and that's that's something. I mean, that block diagram that I that I showed, um, mm -hmm. there are structures that run through those anticlinal hinges, and even within that, so we know the anticlines are are focusing the fluids. The structures are bringing the fluids in, but it's within um, particular reactive units in the stratigraphy where we're getting the gold mineralization. Um, they're um, interbedded siltstones and sandstones, and it's in the dirty siltstones where, where we're getting the, in this case, the gold dropping out. Um, it's, and, and that's where even at that one site, <clears throat> there are multiple different aspects of, of the geology on a, on a small scale that are coming together to, um, to act as, as the trap site. And you know the petroleum system. The, the image that I put up there was pretty simple. Um, there are obviously other other trapping mechanisms in in the petroleum system, but I think I think we have a, a lot more um, variability in in the system that we're dealing with. It, it's just inherently more complex. But we st it's still if you don't have a trap, if you don't have some sort of choke to pull the metal out of um, the fluid, then you're just going to get a whole heap of alteration and dispersed or disseminated mineralization. It's never going to be an ore body. So it's still a very important concept for us, even if it's a chemical trap rather than a physical trap. It's still obviously a very, very important uh, concept. Thank you so much. Um, this question was in the context of when you were explaining like the future steps or the future generation job in in creating these process models for mineral exploration instead of the classic approach that we have been used for a long time. And this person asks, um, how do you explain that to investors? That markets, I think, are model driven. And how do we start shifting this paradigm? That's going, that is going to be a difficult one because um, the you know, in, investors and analysts are, are comfortable with the language that we use, and I don't. I don't know that we need to. Um, that's going to sound really rude if I said I don't know we, if we need to confuse them, um, because they're really really smart people. But you know, when we're talking to investors, it's about a deposit that we found, and I think we can still use that terminology and and say you know these are. These are epithermal veins, for example. I think it's more, it's more for us as an industry to start letting go of, of doing exploration backwards, you know, starting with what we expect to find, and then how do we detect that? And, and being more open to saying what might there be in this area with this mineral system, with this in all these different features, you know, an area where we see evidence of mantle fertility, you know, we know we've got big structures, we know that we've got um, different times in geological history where we've had these geodynamic triggers. Um, I think it, it's it's more certainly at this stage, it's more for us to say how do we how do we think in that that sort of forward looking way. Um, and it may be that that we find, as I say, deposit types or even commodities um, that we predict them um, on a broader scale. Um, that, I mean, that's 
that's what I would expect um, rather than, than being more limited to think this is this is the deposit style that we're, that we're looking for. And I, I think, you know, we there are lots of examples where um, exploration teams have have been too driven by by what they expected to see and have walked over um, highly prospective ground and other deposit types because they hadn't thought about what else might be there. So I think taking taking this approach where where you're thinking about the process, you're thinking about the possibility, um, I I would hope would would open open people's eyes to to what other deposits might be in a region. Thank you so much, Ali. I think this perspective that you provided today is opening like a lot of discussion in the Q and A, and it's bad. We only have time for one more question, so I'm gonna jump into a different one, and it says, on a district scale, what kind of analysis do you recommend conducting to investigate the fertility and geodynamics of epithermal deposits? Okay, I'm I'm going to I'm going to say this. This is the type of question we have to try and get away from because this question is presupposing that the end product is an epithermal deposit, right? And this is where I think, I think we have to, you know, we, we know the geological or the geographical areas, which are prospective, we, we can build our mineral systems models and then see what comes comes out of it. I don't I think if we're too we're too prescriptive if we say what mineral system is going to give us an epithermal deposit, that I think is in my you know my subtitle when I talked about the pitfall of the mineral system, that I think is is the trap that we fall into because we're so used to thinking about about deposit types. I was at a, at a, in a presentation not so long ago, and someone was talking about a particular, a very good presentation about the, the potential of a particular area. And they talked about, but it's a fairly, geographically, a fairly small area. And they talked about, um, oh, and here we've got the epithermal mineral system. And, and then, you know, here we've got the, the porphyry copper gold mineral system. And, and I'm looking at it and thinking, it is one, it is one mineral system those are different outcomes. And if we're, we're sort of restricting the way that we think, if we, if we keep thinking, if we're too driven by what the product is, we really, in my opinion, to make that step change in, in what we're doing, we have to be always thinking about the process and be a bit more agnostic about the, what the end point is. Thank you so much for your contribution, Sally. This was a great discussion. And like, as I say, there are still some questions and comments in the Q&A section, if you can have some time and check them. Uh, I see people yeah. is really getting to continue this. So thank you so I'll just, much. I'll just say, I'm just gonna say one thing. I, I saw the comment from Tim Krask saying that WMC used the tree analogy, um, you know, back in the day. What goes around comes around. I, I think it's it's a great analogy. It and clearly it's not it's not static. It's not like a snapshot in time. For me, it's it's just a concept of what that process model looks like and, and how we can build um, what what the system might be. And I'm sorry, I keep waving my hands around in front of the camera, and they look very big. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Don't worry. I think you're overly conscious right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, please, I'm going to request people to stay uh, because we still have our president-elect uh, participation and I, 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 I'd like to introduce him. Um, thank you so much, Shelly, and we are going to move on to Stephen Piercy uh, Bayo. Uh, he is the SDG president-elect in 2023. Uh, Stephen has completed an BS and MS from the Memorial University of Newfoundland and a PhD from the University of British Columbia. 
From 2001 to 2008, he held the position of assistant professor and associate professor in the Mineral Exploration Research Center and Department of Earth Sciences at the Laurentian University. Between 2007 and 2009, he, he was the principal of SGP Geoconsulting, a St. John's-based consulting firm focused on the application of field and laboratory techniques to mineral exploration and development. Since December 2009, he has worked in the Department of Earth Sciences at Memorial University as an associate professor, professor, and is currently a university research professor since 2021 until today. Uh, he is a registered professional geologist in Newfoundland and Labrador, Ontario, and Saskatchewan, and now he is the SDG president elect. I welcome him to join us and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so Steve uh, can 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 do it. Um, Thank you uh, very much, Valeria. Um, so I'm just gonna have a few slides and uh, Stuart and I did not collude, but you'll hear some of the similar themes. Uh, what I'm going to briefly talk about is just some of the goals and initiatives that are, I have planned in conjunction with colleagues at SEG for 2024. And then I'm going to end this uh, talk with um, just some thank yous for people's contributions this year. So really, uh, there's four main goals that my colleagues and I have sort of uh, hoped to do in 2024. Uh, one is revisiting the strategic plan that was started uh, in 2021 2022. Um, this will be the main goal for 2024 for much of the society. We have a really good plan that we uh, created in 2018. However, this plan really, really needs revision, updating, and change to reflect new realities in the society. And uh, we handed a survey out to the membership, and one-sixth of the membership of the society provided really outstanding feedback and commentary uh, on what we do well and things that they would like to see changed. And this is really going to help us guide uh, the strategic planning exercise in 2024. Uh, coincident with that is going to be a bylaw revisions. Uh, the plan is uh, with a society is, as um, with such history as ours, uh, a lot of our bylaws are, are, are they, they reflect that history. And in many cases, they're not necessarily as fit for purpose for today as they were when they were created. So the idea is that we're going to revise these in parallel with the strategic plan. Uh, some revisions took place in 2023 mostly to modernize things and make um, uh, things more streamlined and useful. And the goal is to increase SEG functionality, the transparency of decision-making processes, but also ensure that there isn't barriers. Uh, there aren't barriers to participating, participating in the society and its governance by our members. Um, we're still gonna focus on our student and early career professionals programs. Uh, things like the student chapter program, SEG grants, uh, field trips and so on. Uh, but we also hope to have a plan uh, and create a fund to help subsidize and provide memberships for uh, for those that are in developing countries where there are significant cost and or logistical barriers to society membership and participation. So we ask that you uh, keep uh, keep abreast of uh, of some notifications regarding this. And the hope is that we'll go on a fundraising campaign so that we can create uh, funds that can be used to support uh, individuals that are um, often have challenges taking part in SEG activities and becoming members. And another thing that's important is our publications. Uh, Stuart talked about this, but uh, Larry is stepping down as editor of economic geology at the end of 2024. And we're currently searching for a new editor. Uh, their, Larry will overlap with the editor and the hope is that um, this will result in a seamless transition to ensure a pipeline of papers, the same quality and expectations that our members have now, uh, associated editorial board replacements, and so that there's a seamless transition and that economic geology uh, still maintains the high standard and is the journal that we, um, we, we all go to and value as our members. We're also seeing the stepping down of uh, Sean Barker at the end of 2023 from the uh, publications board. And we're currently in the process of advertising for a new uh, pub board chair. Uh, this is a really important position. Publications are a really key component of what we do. And we're really facing some significant uh, challenges in terms of open access and expectations of governments globally. And the idea is to make sure that we have a consistent publication stream. And 
tonight and many of the things that we do, including our publications, are really the core of our business. Our business is content delivery for our membership. And while we may change some of the ways that we do things, revise bylaws and change sort of our strategic approaches, um, we've been doing this for a long time. And this is going to be core for our business going forward. And so I'm going to switch gears here to uh, put forward some thanks to people. And this builds on the content delivery. But tonight is an example of what we do for content delivery. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers for outstanding content you show uh, you know, are, the, are examples of uh, the good that we do and are the cutting edge of the research, both on the industrial and university sides. And I'd like to thank Valeria for uh, outstanding timekeeping uh, and all the speakers for staying on time, the outstanding discussions and the people that have stuck around to, um, to actually take part. Much appreciated. Um, I'd like to also go on in terms of content. SEG London 2023 was an outstanding meeting. I'd like to thank Bob Foster and his group. And this was the first real uh, post-COVID meeting that felt like the old times. And it was an outstanding meeting with fantastic content. And we look forward to, uh, I'd like to thank those that put this meeting forward, but also invite you all to Vindhook in 2024, which will also be another outstanding meeting. Um, I'd also like to thank the people that actually work behind the scenes, the volunteers that are really critical to making the society work. I, I put the XCOM members here uh, just because they're the people that I've been working with mostly this year. But I also encourage you to go and click the website below and check out the various committees and see how many people volunteer and contribute to our society. Uh, there is a deep commitment by our members to give back, and it's very much appreciated by my colleagues and I at SEG. Um, with that, I'd like to thank a number of people who have made significant contributions in the last few years. Uh, Stuart mentioned Chico Acevedo, our past president, who's stepping down at the end of the year. Jennifer mentioned uh, our vice president of regional affairs, Mike Venter, who's also stand, stepping down. Both have made important contributions in the last few years at a, at a very uh, significant time of change in the society. And I'd also like to thank Jose Arche, Sarah Dare, as well as Richard Harrington, our uh, outgoing counselor from uh, the executive committee. Um, I'd also like to welcome our incoming XCOM members, including uh, counselors Alina Gabor, Anthony Harris, and Roberto Xavier, our uh, new VP of Regional Affairs, Julie Rowland, and our president-elect, Ann Thompson. I'd like to uh, thank them all and look forward to working with them all next year. Oh, sorry. And uh, finally, I'm going to end with uh, a lot of what you do is volunteer based, but there's an outstanding staff in Littleton led by Jen Craig and her team. And a lot of the things you see, including things like tonight, the education training program, the publications, the student programs, the early career things, all the things that you see in our organization, there's a volunteer component, but there's also a really significant and important contribution from the SEG staff. And I put them up here. I'm not going to name them all, but they've made a really important contributions that deserve to be recognized. And uh, at this time of year, it's a, a time to thank our friends and family and uh, celebrate uh, the good things that are that we uh, have together. And I wish you all the best for the holiday season and look forward to uh, working and interacting with you in the membership 2024. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, for your participation. Uh, I I just want to add on on what you say that being a student that did here her undergrad in Ecuador, I have seen firsthand firsthand the impact that SEG has across the globe, and I really like that. So thank you so much for being here with us. Um, we really appreciate your contributions and looking forward for what next. And likewise with you. So thank you again for taking care of this tonight. It's been an outstanding evening. So thank you. Thank you. So to start to wrap up, as um, Steve shared with us, there are exciting things coming next year. And as usual with SEG, and I just want to share those with you before you leave, please. Our upcoming SEC SEG events, um, we have a, a couple of them. Uh, next year, we have the Lithium. Uh, webinar uh, for installment of SDG based metal webinar series focused on current market market trends, exploration successes, and academic research around the commodity. Great for students and early careers interested in the developing opportunities within the lithium industry. It's going to be in January. 
Uh, we also have the Orogenic Gold. This two-day course will focus on the geology of an exploration for Orogenic Gold deposit, deposit, the most widespread type of gold deposit globally. Leading expert will provide description of the most important Precambrian and Panerozoic examples of Orogenic Gold ore formed in the world's young accretionary origins and old cratonic greenstone belt. Presenters will be Rich Goldfer, Glenn Noalia, Caitlin Jones, and Bob Foster. This is going to be in February in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, Leech Capins and Gobsons, an upcoming hands on course in, at the ROM, ROM in Toronto, presented by Bill Chavez with support from Dow Kirbin. Visit SEG website for more information, please. And this is going to be in March in Toronto. So, also, I'd like to invite all of you to uh, go and, and listen to our podcast, Discovery to Recover. For all of you, podcast lover, a new season of the SEG podcast, Discovery to Recovery, has already started. Thanks to the general sponsorship of Anglo American, a new set of episodes are in the pipeline. Also, a special thank you to Anne Thompson for all of her amazing work on this podcast. Look for them anywhere you listen to your podcast or just visit our website. Um, to finalize, I would like to um, please ask a steward to join us again, just to promote um, some material that we have. So uh, at the uh, London conference, uh, we sold 16 volumes signed by the uh, uh, editors of the gold and copper volume. Uh, we sold them for $1,000 each uh, and with funds going to uh, the New Century Fund uh, to support uh, students and early career professionals. We have four copies remaining. Uh, these will be announcing this in an uh, email uh, coming up, uh, but uh, the last four copies are available. So uh, just if you're interested, uh, let us know. Thanks, Valeria. Thanks to you, Stuart, for keeping up with us. Uh, and now I think um, I just want to share also that next year we will have our SDG Namibia. We are incredibly excited to announce that SDG 2024 conference will be held in Windhoek, Namibia in late September next year. Uh, themes are being finalized and will be announced shortly, but they will focus on a number of relevant issues related to African exploration and metallogeny with both a regional and global context. This is a great opportunity for students, early career and seasonal professionals to come and really immerse themselves in a truly geologically unique and culturally vibrant part of the world. And now that we are currently planning to offer multiple field trips throughout the region and handful of workshops along with the technical conference session. So stay tuned for more details. And funding opportunities for student participation and travel will be available. And honestly, as I said before, I had the opportunity to participate in this year conference. It was amazing. So I highly encourage everyone to come and share whatever they are researching. And this is a great environment to learn from other people. Uh, finally, I just want to say Thank you for attending. For those people that are still here with us, I'm so grateful and I want to thank the attendees, the presenters, and the membership. It's highly encouraged once, once again. And thank you for all the members across the globe. Without your participation and engagement, this wouldn't be possible. Um, and please, I also want to give a uh, Last heads up, there is a, a small survey to complete and that will appear once this webinar has end. And that's all I have to share with you for today. Thank you so much. And hopefully we will have you in our next events. Bye then.